tell the body before we start any sunlight on the first. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, webinar organized by Safe Motherhood Committee. Uh, today, our topic is obsolete. Uh, for this wonderful webinar, we have our uh, Master of Cer Ceremony, Dr. Shravya Manohar, ma'am. Dr. Shravya, ma'am, is a consultant obstetric and gynecologist at uh, Apollo Women Hospital, and she is a member of Oxy. I'm handing over the session to Shravya, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Chitrakala, for that introduction. First and foremost, I would like uh, to extend a very warm welcome to you all on behalf of the Safe Motherhood Committee. We started off in 2023 having our very first program in person, after which we have had a series of webinars since February 2023 till date. So today we actually have our 13th webinar of the Safe Motherhood Committee. Today's scientific session focuses on obstetric hemorrhage, and I'll be taking you through it all. Obstetric hemorrhage remains a leading cause of maternal morbidity and mortality, so understanding and effectively managing obstetric hemorrhage is paramount. Throughout this session, we will delve into the latest guidelines and best practices to optimize patient outcome in this challenging clinical scenario through our experts today. I would first like to start with the Tamil Thai Varta, followed by the virtual lighting of the Kutuvelaka. <laughs> We now have the Oxy prayer by Dr. Kundavi Shankar. Kundavi Ma'am is a secretary of Oxy, head of department and senior consultant at IRM Triple M with over 20 years of expertise. She's leading a successful fellowship program at Triple M with many an achievement to her. Over to you. Thank you, Shravya. Thank you, God. In humility, we gather. In gratitude, we pray for all the good things you have given us. Shower us with your blessings to pass on the healing touch, to celebrate the arrival of each new life and a mum reborn, the courage to deal with it when things are not perfect, and to remember that we are but messengers to keep our women safe and free from sorrow. We bow before your kindness and the magnanimity of your endless love. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to call upon Dr. Jairani Kamraj to deliver the welcome address. 
Ma'am needs no introduction. She's our um, Oxy president. She's a senior consultant of reproductive medicine, director at Akash Fertility Center and Hospital Chennai. Um, and she holds multiple offices in both Indian and international medical organizations and has many accolades. Thank you. Thank you, Shravya. We'll go to the scientific end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shravya, for the nice introduction. And uh, it gives me a great pleasure and honor to be here in our one of the best committee being organized every month. Good webinars. Uh, very special kudos to Rajri and Vasundha Mani heading this committee. They are doing an amazing, wonderful work on the uh, Safe Motherhood Committee with a lot of new insights about the problems that we face regularly in our clinical practice. We all know obstetric hemorrhage is a nightmare for every obstetrician, whether it's an early, early pregnancy or late pregnancy, everything has a problem. So we are here to hear a lot of uh, knowledge, expertise, experience, and all the uh, very, very senior persons here to share their experiences on this topic of obstetric hemorrhage. And I'm very honored and very much glad to welcome the senior experts for this uh, webinar, Dr. Anjalakshi Madam and Premlata Madam, who are the teachers of teachers and many of the best persons who can talk on this content, being an expert in this. Madam, we welcome you all on behalf of Oxy23. Thank you. Thank you. And I have the great pleasure to welcome Ramani Devi Madam and Dr. Betsy Thomas, who have a great experience and knowledge in sharing their experiences with an antipartum hemorrhage and the placenta creta, which are very much a needed topic for the practicality because many a times the previous cesarean section comes and all, we have a lot of difficulty facing these type of a cases in, in more on the rise of days. So it is a very important topic to be discussed all through the years and it has been so nicely coined here. And I have the great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sumana and Dr. Deepa. Uh, Madam, both have a very great experience in managing many of the complicated cases in a tertiary care corporate hospital setup. And they will be definitely be the best right persons to share their experience about the postpartum hemorrhage. I have a pleasure to welcome you, Sumana, Madam, and Deepa. And the panelists here, Dr. Gomati, Dr. Mamira, Dr. Nidhi Sharma, Dr. Sailata, Dr. Vanila, and Dr. Meghna. And all this credit goes to one person, Dr. Uh, Rajri, for making this a webinar a grand one. Thank you, uh, Rajri and Vasandamani for organizing this wonderful webinar. I once again welcome you all the senior experts, all the uh, doings in this field for this webinar. We welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining with us. Over to you, Shravya. Thank you so much. Without much further ado, let's start our scientific session for today. We are privileged and honored to have with us Dr. Anjalakshi and Dr. Premlata as our experts for today. Anjalakshi, ma'am, is a senior consultant obstetrician gynecologist Chennai. She's a founder president of TNF4G, past president of Oxy, governing council member of DIPSI. Um, she's recipient of Best Doctor Award from IMA and reti retired professor at Madras Medical College and Madha Medical College. She's presented, uh, presented a numerous numbers of, a number of national and international conferences. Dr. Premlata is a consultant, head of academics department, obstetrics and gynecology at Dr. Mehta's Hospital, Chennai. She's a past president, Oxy, former director in charge of IOG Chennai, former professor department uh, of Obzin Gyne at MMC, presented numerous papers in national and international conferences. She has expertise, particularly in tubal microsurgery, and is a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award by MGR Medical University in 2012. We welcome you, ma'am. Shravya, uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Betsy, the first So we first... We first have our first talk of today's session, which is going to be uh, Placenta Akrita Syndrome. We have Dr. Betsy Thomas um, presenting that today for us. She's a principal and professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Amla Institute of Medical Sciences, Trishur, university topper and pre-degree MBBS and MD OBS in Gaini. She's a FIGO International Fellowship 2009, and she is celebrated for her extensive list of accolades. Over to you, ma'am.
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, respected chairpersons, senior members of the profession, and dear delegates. Uh, first of all, uh, congrats to this team, OGSSI. I'm being part of it for the first time. And thank you so much, Dr. Dajasri, for inviting me to be here. Thank you so much. Shall I share the screen? Yes, ma'am. Is it visible? Uh, Mom, we can see in the documents. The slides are ready to see, Mom. Am I audible? Yes, yes I'm audible. audible. Uh, screen is visible, ma'am. Uh, Mom, ma slides are not seen. Uh, not slides. slides. Can you please stop share once and can you share once again, Mom? Okay, okay. I'll do that. Yes, Mom. Rajeshri, I have also joined. Okay, ma'am. But let her finish. Let her finish. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Visible, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So once again, thank you so much for inviting me. The topic is placenta accreta spectrum. Talking from Kerala a state where confidential review of maternal deaths has been going on from 2004. Initial years, we were surprised to see at least a handful of our mothers were dying because of placenta accreta spectrum, maybe around four to five per year. And now of the latest CRMD, we had been analyzing all our data year by year. Two reports have been published also. For the last few years, it is almost nil or maybe maximum one per year. So that is the data. So that is when we thought of doing something for placenta accreta spectrum and training our medical as well as nursing faculty how to tackle it. So thank you so much for this topic of placenta accreta spectrum. So going back to the basics, placenta accreta spectrum was formerly called morbidly adherent placenta or abnormally invasive placenta. There are three types, as we all know. The placenta accreta, when the placental villi attach to the myometrium rather than the decidua. Placenta increta, when the anchoring placental villi penetrate into the myometrium. And placenta percreta, when the placental villi penetrate through the myometrium to the uterine serosa or the adjacent organs. <laughs> FIGO has come up with a grading, grade 1, 2 and 3. Grade 1 is nothing but placenta accreta. Grade 2 is placenta increta. And grade 3 is placenta percreta, which is subdivided into 3 A, B, and C. 3A is limited to the uterine serosa. 3B is a urinary bladder invasion. And 3C is invasion of other plast uh, pelvic tissues or organs like the parametria. So there can be placental accreta syndrome without previa, but those have better maternal outcome because in Creta and Percreta, the morbidly invasive placenta is less prevalent in the PAs without previa. That means if we have got a PAs without previa, it is mostly placenta accreta rather than in Creta or Percreta. Just going through the risk factors, a history of accreta in the previous pregnancy can contribute to PAs in the future pregnancy. As the number of cesareans increase, the risk of PAs increases. And even other uterine surgeries like repeated endometrial cure attach. And the most important thing is cesarean scar pregnancy is supposed to be a part of the PA spectrum now because in many times those CSP or cesarean scar pregnancy, those are very, very likely to develop into placenta, accreta, increta, percreta. Even we can predict CSP whether it will become accreta, increta, or percreta depending on the depth of invasion of the cesarean scar pregnancy in our NT scan or whatever. 
and to be like in a very like easy way we can take it if it is less than 50 percent of the invasion it is always better if it's more than 50 percent of invasion it is going to be an abnormally invasive placenta it may be even adherent to the bladder so it is always better to do surgery when it is more than 50 percent invasion in the case of cesarean scar pregnancy how can we diagnose placenta accreta spectrum Whenever we get a scan report in which it is an anterior low-lying placenta, especially in a patient with previous cesarean, it's a red flag because the sonologist would not have noted the fact that it's a previous section. They might be just writing the placenta is maybe one centimeter, two centimeter from the internal laws lying anterior. We should, as obstetricians, we should be careful in reading such reports especially in the case of a previous section. We have to go back and ask the sonologist whether they specifically looked for invasive placenta. If not, it's always better to send the patient back to the same sonologist or a better person whom we are very confident with in diagnosing placenta accreta spectrum. Color flow Doppler demonstrating a turbulent lacuna flow is a very valuable confirmatory finding and the disruption of the bladder line. It can be caused by placental percreta or the neo uh, related the neovascular. There'll be a lot of neovascularity associated with placenta accreta spectrum. The importance of this neovascularity is traditionally we believe that the uterine blood supply is from the internal iliac artery, the uterine artery, which is a branch of internal iliac artery, the ovarian artery, which is a branch of abdominal aorta. Not much of supply by ovarian artery. We always think about internal iliac artery. But in placenta accreta spectrum, a lot of blood supply is derived from external iliac artery also through the anterior abdominal wall, especially when it is adherent to bladder and all that. So that is why we cannot just confine to internal iliac artery. We have to think about higher blood vessels also. At 18 to 24 weeks, the prenatal diagnosis of PAS can be made with as close to as 90% accuracy. If we really look forward, only what the mind knows, the eyes will see. So specifically, you have to look for. If the sonologist has forgotten that it's a case of previous section, we have to remind them and a dedicated scan at 18 to 24 weeks. And if you have not done a dedicated scan at that time, at least by 32 weeks, this diagnosis should be made. It is very sad to see that it is missed in one half to two third of the cases because many times PAS comes as a surprise on the table during a cesarean section. What is the role of MRI? Is MRI required in all cases? If a color Doppler is performed by a, by a senior radiologist or an expert radiologist, it is as good as an MRI. So we don't have to go back and confirm with MRI. But MRI can complement ultrasound in the case of like posterior <clears throat> invasion or like uh, we have to see for a parametral invasion or if we want to know the depth of invasion, MRI may be useful, but it is not to be routinely done. Where should women with PAS be cared for? Can they be cared in primary and tertiary centers? No. If we diagnose, the patient has to be referred to the higher center. Need not wait till term because many times the problems can happen before that. Immediately we can refer. Even we have had incidents when it has, like patients that come with bleeding, placenta percreta, perforation and hemoperitoneum with three, three gram of HP and all that, even at 22 weeks. So refer immediately to a center where there is immediate access to blood products, there's a good adult intensive care unit, neonatal intensive unit, and a multidisciplinary team with a good blood bank support, anesthesia support, and even critical care support if possible, and with expertise in complex pelvic surgery. When should we deliver a PAS patient? Planned delivery at 35 to 36 plus 6 according to Royal College. ACOGC is 34 to 35 plus 6. The main advantage of early delivery is we have to, we can avoid a risk of unscheduled delivery. Such a patient coming in the middle of the night with bleeding, it is going to be a nightmare to any obstetrician. We have to balance between the fetal maturity and avoiding the risks of unscheduled delivery. Whenever we are comfortable, anything after 34 weeks is advisable. If you are delivering early, we can talk about steroids also. What all should be included in the consent form? Definitely, it is a case for massive obstetric hemorrhage. The consent should be taken separately for the possibility of massive blood transfusion. 
We cannot assume that the routine surgery consent is for ma massive blood transfusion. The consent should be separate. There should be consent for risk of lower urinary tract damage, bladder as well as ureter. Risk of hysterectomy, obstetric hysterectomy. All this should be there in the consent form. If possible, written by the patient and the bystander in the local language rather than having printed consent forms. During surgery, prophylactic oxytocin is not routinely administered after the infant. We all practice active management of third stage of labor. Here, we should not be giving any oxytoxics because it might lead to partial uh, placental separation and can cause increased bleeding. However, if the placenta has been mostly or completely removed and if the bleeding is heavy, definitely eutrotonic drugs should be given. We had all been doing internal iliac artery ligation earlier. But now we know that it's going to be time consuming because patient is going to lose blood. We have to like uh, we have to dissect the tissue and then only we can reach the internal iliac artery and it can be cumbersome at times, unnecessary time waste. Plus, we know that the supply can be from external iliac artery also. Internal iliac artery ligation alone cannot, su cannot be sufficient. Not only that, in the case of a post-operative bleed, if you want to do uh, like uh, embolization, or if we want to do some pelvic angiography, some investigation has to be done on the patient again to know the, which is the bleeder. Again, once we have ligated bilateral internal iliac artery, again, this embolization and other procedures might be difficult. So now we have stopped doing internal iliac artery ligation for PAs routinely, unless there is a added or added reason in drop on the table. How to manage placenta accreta safely? This is a specimen which... I operated just last month. We can see the, the, the degree of perforation. It has come out of the uh, lower segment into the bladder. Hope you can see the picture also. Such a, such a placenta accreta spectrum, if we try to do a routine hysterectomy, will end nowhere. Patient will bleed to death. That is why we should know how to manage PAS safely. In Kerala, as you would have already heard from Piley, sir, Professor V.P. Piley, has come up with a novel dissection-free aorta clamp. Many of you will be already using it, but just to introduce to this crowd, it is a, uh, the problem is, usually the problem is everybody when they talk about a vessel ligation or clamping, we are going for a dissection. We are going to the retropetal tissue, we are dissecting the tissue, then applying the clamp. Even internal iliac artery ligation requires a lot of dissection. Meanwhile, there can be injury to the surrounding vessels also. Here, there is no need for dissection through the peritoneum. Within seconds, we can apply this clamp. We call it Piley aortic clamp, PAC. In, even in low resource settings, we can use this. And it requires minimum training for us to use it. This is a picture of the aorta clamp. As you can all see, it like looks like an anis, but you can see the tip. The tip overlaps with each other so that if we catch the aorta, the aorta cannot slip out from this tip. Even after fully closing the clamp, there is a 2 millimeter gap here between the two blades. That means the aorta will not be crushed between the two blades. That's also very important. If we crush the aorta, there can be intimal damage, injury to the in tunica intima, which can cause, which can attract clot and the major arterial blood vessel clot can be lethal to the patient. This is how we apply. This is just the pelvis and the, imagine there's a red, is the aorta dividing into two common iliac arteries. We can use a long babcock, lift up the aorta, which is now at this point above the bifurcation into the two common iliac arteries. It is far away from the inferior vena cava. There is no risk of you routinely injuring the IVC here. Lift up the aorta with the babcock and apply the clamp. Here, again, I tell you, I remind you, there is no dissection. Anybody with a minimal training can identify and do this. So we all tell the PGs, even in routine cesareans, try to identify the aorta and the common iliac artery because this will be helpful for us in some cases in the future when PAS comes as a surprise on the table. As we all can see in this pelvis, the IVC is usually situated far away from the aorta, it is not a problem. So even the urine at this point of time is away. So aorta can be safely clamped at this point of place. How long can we clamp the aorta? There is a lot of experience coming from orthopedic surgeons. They do amputation clamping the big vessels. 
they clamp for one hour without any problem. So the same experience from the orthopedicians we have also adopted. Even after clamping for one hour, nothing goes wrong. The only thing is we have to alert the anesthetist when we are clamping iota. We don't clamp iota at the beginning. We do the cesarean. We deliver the baby. Then only we go for iota clamp. Then finish off the obstetric hysterectomy. We look at the clock. Every five minutes, somebody has to keep the time and then warn us. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes like that. So that usually uh, the surgery is over within 60 minutes. If at all it gets over beyond, I mean, it gets prolonged beyond 60 minutes, we can uh, like tell the anesthetist, uh, release the clamp, make sure the lower limb pulsations are back and then again clamp again so that we can exceed. Even one hour we can exceed, but we, have, we might have to release the clamp in between. So that is about the clamp. It's the same thing. This is just the theory part of it. The blunt tips which overlap act as a guard to prevent the vessel. Smooth inner surface. That's why there's no injury to the vessel. As I already mentioned, there is a 2 millimeter gap between the two blades and it prevents injury to the vessel wall and also vasovasorum is also protected. This is just a video. Dr. Rajasri, can you see the video? Yeah, we are able to yes, see. Yes, it's running. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So classical cesarean, we all do classical cesarean. And uh, we have been all taught that for classical cesarean, one third of the incision should be above the umbilicus, but most of the cases we might not. This is an infra umbilical vertical incision. This is 3B. 3B. This was invaded in the same specimen what mm -hmm. I had shown yeah. earlier. This is placenta accreta <laughs> spectrum, PAS 3B. It was invading into the blood. Full video is not there, but at least we can see how the iota can be clamped, how easily it can be clamped by any of us. Classical cesarean, you can see the blood vessels in the lower part, the lower segment. It's very vascular. Baby is delivered. No oxytocin at this point of time as you would have routinely done. Even how much ever sure the radiologist is about plasma necrosis spectrum, you can just have a look at it and make sure it's a morbidly adherent placenta because sometimes we get surprised. Placenta will be coming out by the time we deliver the baby. So make sure it's a morbidly adherent placenta before we clamp the iota. Okay, now we go to the retro-uterine space or retro area. And then we are trying to, now the camera's position has changed. We are trying to identify the iota and try to hold with the Babcocks. It should be a long Babcocks. Sorry for the head coming in between. That's iota. iota as you can see, iota is clamped now. That is a, This is iota. Iota has been no uh, peritoneal dissection. It was lifted up with the Babcock and just clamped with the iota clamp. That's all. And what is the role of uretric stent? Many people routinely do uretric stent. We all used to do, but there are currently insufficient data to recommend the routine use of uretric stent. It might have a role when the urinary bladder is invaded by the plasma tissue. That is our 3B and beyond. What should be the type of anesthesia? Either spinal plus epidural or a GA, GA or GA plus epidural. The only thing is we might go for a longer time. So it is always better to have epidural inside. Venous thromboembolism prophylaxis also very, very important after an obstetric hysterectomy because this is a case. We almost like in many of the cases, especially when we are using like uh, intraiotic balloon, many of you might be using intraiotic balloon. Even we used to use intraiotic balloon earlier. We were forced to give thromboprophylaxis on the table because many times we see that once we 
a distant diotic balloon and then once we finish the surgery we can see the long clot coming out of their sheath so we were forced to give venous thromboembolism prophylaxis on the table but for this purpose for aorta clamp once we release the clamp at the end of the surgery just massage the aorta the flow will be normal we have we don't have to worry about the lower limb pulsations but the only thing is any obstetric hysterectomy requires a vt prophylaxis any role for uterus preserving surgery? Definitely there is a role for uterus preserving surgery provided the extent of placenta accreta is limited in depth and surface area. For example, it is a completely anterior fundal where it is accessible all around the myometrum is accessible or a posterior without deep pelvic invasion. Uterine preserving surgery may be appropriate. We can remove that wedge resection of the placenta where the placenta is adherent and we can suture the myometrium. But women should be Informed about the high risk of peripartum and secondary complications, they are high risk for a secondary hysterectomy. With that consent, we can try uterus preserving surgery. Earlier, there was a school of thought that in morbidly adrenal placenta, we can leave the placenta. Many of us have done that also. We can leave the placenta and give methotrexate. Now, the methotrexate is out of question because... There has been clear evidence of drug-related harms like pancytopenia and nephrotoxicity. Even if we, leave, we have to leave the placenta behind, we don't have to give methotrexate because of the harmful effects. <laughs> you would have all heard about the triple, pre -pro uh, triple P procedure, the conservative surgical approach without doing an obstetric hysterectomy. The reports came from Dr. Edwin Chandraharan. Sir gave uh, the report of a few patients who underwent the triple P procedure. Triple P is nothing but first P is for perioperative localization of the upper placenta ledge. On the table in the theater, we can get the ultrasound and see what is the exact upper part of the upper placenta ledge. Second is pelvic devascularization with temporary balloon occlusion of bilateral internal iliac arteries. Here it is basically the bilateral internal iliac arteries. Third thing is no the placental non-separation with myometrial excision followed by repair of the myometrial defect. So this is a triple P procedure. But the number, the in this article which has been reported, the number has been very low to recommend it to everyone. So when can we do interventional radiology? Many centers, especially centers with good cath lab and cardiac support, many centers have practiced interventional radiology with intraiotic balloon, common iliac artery balloon, embolization, etc. But again, two patients, we had very bad experience with intraiotic balloon. Uh, one, one patient, as I already said, once we removed the sheath, a long big clot came out. We were forced to give uh, intraoperative heparin and the patient started bleeding. He struck me went without any problem, but patient started bleeding in the post-operative period because maybe because of heparinization and we had to give a massive blood transfusion. In the second patient, at the end of the procedure, the lower limb pulsations were completely absent. So that was a great worry for us. And again, intraoperative heparinization, again, patient went for a hemorrhage. That is why we all moved on to aortic clamp, where there's no worry for such things, but we give a routine post-operative VT prophylaxis. Okay. What if we get an unsus unsuspected PAS at delivery? This is a nightmare. Okay, it might be in the middle of the night when we thought that it's a routine cesarean uh, an emergency, previous section coming in labor, and we are taking up in the middle of the night. If we just open the abdomen and see that it is a very vascular lower segment with suspected placenta yeah. percret, or maybe even ready to perforate, this we don't yeah. have to like we don't have to show any of the things. We can just close and come anything. out. Or if we are in a primary or a secondary center. Our ego need not work yeah. there. We can just close the abdomen and refer yeah. to the higher right. center. Patient has just had yeah. maybe a general yeah. anesthesia or a regional anesthesia. Does not yeah. matter. Yeah. It's always better not to touch that placenta. In some cases, we might have delivered the baby and then realized that it is a placenta accreta spectrum and patient starts bleeding. It is usually a transverse incision. We were not anticipating. We would not have put a vertical incision. It might be a transverse incision. The same aorta clamp can be used over common iliac arteries. The two aorta clamp can be used over two common iliac arteries. Common iliac arteries are easily accessible through our routine fan and incision. Once we exterize the uterus and go to the back side of the uterus and try to uh, see the common iliac arteries, maybe from, for every section we can do that. Try to uh, uh, memorize our anatomy, where the common iliac artery is. 
and we can clamp the common iliac artery just like we, we showed in the uh, aorta yeah. clamp just pick up with babcock and without any dissection same clamps can be used over the common iliac artery actually speaking when pilisa started training us he had provided two uh, aorta clamp to all our institutions to get trained and we were all using in the common iliac artery in the initial period but by mistake in one center in kerala it was used over aorta clamp yeah. And then people all converted to aorta clamp because there is no increased risk with one vessel clamp. We can have the same efficacy. So we have all switched over from common iliac artery to aorta clamp. And at the end of the session, the take-home messages, we have to always anticipate a placenta accreta spectrum. Otherwise, how much of an expert you are, without a team support, without the help of a blood bank, without the help of our anesthesiologist, without the help of maybe urologist, how many of our iota clamp you have put, you might be in soup. So always anticipate a dedicated scan. If you have missed in the anomaly scan, a dedicated scan at at least 32 weeks in all previous cesarean to roll, roll out a placenta. Actually, recently, tomorrow I'm going to operate on a patient, previous section, fifth month anomaly scan was absolutely normal placenta was upper segment but recently we got a scan report saying that placenta is over over the uh, previous scar so such surprises also we can get so we have to always anticipate be prepared once it is a pas if i'm working in a primary or secondary center i should refer i should not manage that patient in my center if at all it's a tertiary center where i am working with all the facilities i should have my support senior and junior colleagues everyone will be of help in such a case at least the moral support we should have. And finally, as I said, and we need not hesitate to refer to our senior colleague or another center also. And once again, thank you so much. Any queries, we can all clarify together. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Yeah. Betsy. Very nicely you have taken us through the placenta accreta spectrum. Two cases you have shown, are they both from uh, previous cesarean cases? Placenta Krita, one specimen you told and I showed and yes. another one. Yes, 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 Small yes, yeah. yes, ma'am. So uh, just uh, because we all uh, come across higher incidence of PAS because of the high incidence of C-section. So yes. anticipate, as you are told, anticipation is very, very, very important in case of PAS. Every woman, when they come for a scan, we have to see where is the location of the placenta, and we should, if even if it is a posterior placenta, sometimes we have we can have a placenta crita where only MRI picks up very well. So uh, anticipation, high index of suspicion nowadays in order to know whether it is a placenta crita syndrome goes a long way. In un unsuspected and coming in the middle of the night, then it is a, really a problem. Uh, books say that we can uh, close the thing and we can send it, transfer it. Many times we may have to get a consent for an emergency, in situ hysterectomy, uh, peripartum hysterectomy, we may have to do in such cases, like instead of leaving the uterus with all the uh, products. So I think uh, placenta accreta is a nightmare and our incidence, and you were telling four per year it is coming in your... in Earlier in, earlier years, ma'am. Earlier years, we had up to four to five maternal deaths per year. In Kerala, see, the number of deaths is low. On top of year, that, this year. year, four to five. Ma'am. So because you had uh, removed all the preventive causes, this has come into work. That is yes, yes, right. So right, our right. aim ultimately is to only to anticipate and uh, uh, make sure the patient is not anemic, have a multidisciplinary approach, and we have to tackle her. I feel in the, if the uh, uterine embolization, people are aware there is an intervention in radiology, though there is a thing. I think uh, if you can take the patient to a place where intervention radiology is there, you can put in a balloon catheter, uh, into the internal iliac artery, do a surgery, deliver the baby, and then depending upon it, then we can also give the uh, inject the gel foam and uh, further procedures can be done. Triple fit procedure, I don't know. It's very difficult unless we master it. It's very difficult to do, I think, because if it is going to be an invasion into the serosa and comes in contact with the uh, I mean, bladder and other area, it's really very difficult for to have a uh, proper excision and uh, closure. We need a Eurogyro as, as told in the literature. We have to have multi-speciality people to be with us, uh, urologists, in, in we are suspecting things. And sometimes even the uh, penetration go into the broad ligament where it can go up to the pelvic sidewalls. So we have to have all vascular surgeon thing to tackle. Thank you, Dr. Betsy. You have given a very Dr. 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 Betsy, uh, Rajasri, one minute. Dr. Yes. Betsy, it was an excellent talk. 
okay and uh, the uh, necessity is the um, master or the mother of invention so our regards to dr peili it was a simple thing he has innovated so for um, hats off to him for his innovation yes, thank yes. you sir. thank you dr but see where is the clap available everywhere is it available okay shall i shall i tell a number because yes, 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 there are yes. so many people are listening to us and you should, yes. uh, you should i'll put uh, up in the chat box actually yes, that number belongs to one mr worky who is uh, who is our office staff kerala federation of obstetrics and gynecology office staff yes, he okay. will give the number of the person who has got the clamp because another yes. person is manufacturing for pidi sir i'll i'll share the number in the chat box think, uh, just okay. like we are doing whenever we do cesarean we have a forces vacuum for delivering the baby yeah. should be in the theater so that yeah. in case that's it be yeah yeah it should be even yeah, for an atonic yeah. pph or yeah. anything it will be definitely useful and we should yeah. propagate the message of the pac usage in uh, obstetric hemorrhage Thank the you. mantra anticipate be prepared yes, and do not hesitate it is a very nice mantra every post graduate should remember this okay Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Question, ma'am. How you so to much. deal with the bladder extension of PAS? There's a question in the box. Okay, okay. Uh, bladder extension. We cannot. We need not hesitate to open the bladder, remove that part, and then suture again. Actually, you know, the patient whom I was showing, we entered in the bladder because it was three B. We entered in the bladder. It was a big bladder. Actually, I had to call the urologist because it was a long bladder extension. Otherwise, small tears and all we can manage. If we close in two layers with two zero vicryl, it will be sufficient. We can manage. Make sure that it's not gone close to the ureter. Uh, we have to open the bladder. Systotomy, removal, and then suturing. Is there any differential diagnosis? It was found in the antenatal scan, madam. It was, found, it was found. It was found. It was into the bladder, infiltrating into the bladder. So we had actually they were in the, in the theater. Actually, they were all anticipating. <laughs> Is there any differential diagnosis, Betsy? For this? Ah, uh, yeah. Placenta percreta. Yeah. Okay, person with previous cesarean. Maybe we may, we might be mistaken in those people who did not have any previous section. We might have to think about some local tumor and all that. If you are asking okay. that locally vascular yeah. tumor, otherwise yeah, in a yeah. previous section there is no differential diagnosis. It should be very yeah. unless no, no. otherwise so proved it is a rent, uh, rent of the scar, and you can see the placenta outside. Okay, so that yes. can also be mistaken sometimes. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. Betsy, Thank you. I have Thank you. A question. Can I ask Shravya? Um, yeah. Basically, if you have such an extensive pleasant invasion, uh, saying excision and closure, um, so have you done it yourself? And uh, what is your experience on that? No, no, we have not done. We have not done, especially extensive. Most of these cases are usually extensive uh, invasion. Maybe small foci, maybe we can do. Otherwise, it's very difficult. Even those who have done also, patients will come with secondary hemorrhage and all that. Mm. Unless a patient wants to conserve the uterus, no. it is so always better to... Invasion is the less than 50%, no? It yeah, be, that's uh, true. It should be a small area. Okay. That's true. Have you ever conserved the uterus in these patients? And small small areas of even when the sonologist says that it is a small area of uh, uh, invasion, definitely that area we can do a small vaginal section and then suture, just like we close the uterus after upper segment cesarean. It will be thick, but you can close. Have you ever left the uh, placenta in, I mean, and then <laughs> come out and then waiting for the tray? Uh, placenta to go for autolysis? It's so not it for placenta accreta spectrum. Not for PAs, otherwise our routine normal delivery, when it doesn't come, we all wait, uh, but never given methotrexate. By the time we wait after a few hours, fortunately, it comes out on its own. That's what usually happens after vaginal delivery, not after previous section. There's another question, ma'am. In the event of highly vascular lower segment, can we just refer if in a low resource setting without... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> no, no issue because no, see no, what no. is other we are talking about a placenta previa we are suspecting a placenta previa accreta spectrum once we open the uterus we cannot do anything we have to deliver and we can tackle especially if blood is not available help is not available it is we don't have to hesitate to refer even after opening because so many cases we do abdominal surgeries during pregnancy it's just like an abdominal surgery during pregnancy you have not opened the uterus there, if we don't have facility, it's always better to refer because otherwise patient might lose her life just because we have touched the uterus. Without touching the uterus on opening, they, they say you can close it and then send it to a yes. transfer to a higher. Yes. 
Yes, mm -hmm. it is just like do, do, doing maybe ovariotomy or appendicectomy during pregnancy. We all do that. It's just like that only. Opening and closing and anesthesia is not a problem for the mother or the baby. Suppose the, the facilities are not there, they have opened, delivered the baby, but placenta is uh, densely at their end. Then the, can they close without touching the placenta, close and plan for a secondary hysterectomy later on? Yes. That person, no? We can yes, do yes, that. Yes, definitely. We can, yes. we can do that. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Really, thank you. Sravya, you can... Uh, ma'am, we... Uh, so thank you, Betsy, ma'am, for delivering such an informative and engaging talk. Um, the visuals really, really helped us throughout, you know, to keep us engaged as well. Um, next, we have Dr. Ramni Devi, who will be giving a talk on antipartum hemorrhage. Ma'am is President TNFOG, Managing Director of Ramakrishna Medical Center, LLP and Janni Fertility Center. He's won over 10 gold medals during undergrad and post-graduation days. Um, and she has won many more awards and honors. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, you have to unmute, ma'am. I am just unmuting ah, and I'm me sharing me. my yes. slide. Thank you, ma'am. Share me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I thank the Oxy for having me for this important webinar on antipartum hemorrhage. And I'm really happy to say that uh, Dr. Betsy has done a wonderful job. And uh, if you, one of you were asking regarding this uh, uh, triple B procedure. See, that is commonly done in the Gulf countries where they have more number of children. So my daughter who was practicing in Gulf, see, she used to say that... Uh, even a thicker thing, 4 centimeters or 5 centimeters thickness of uh, this one, the myometrium they used to take and they find it is very comfortable and easy for them to close it. Okay, so uh, now uh, the topic given to me is antipartum hemorrhage. Why antipartum hemorrhage is important? It is because it is the major cause of maternal death in developing countries and up to 50% of the maternal deaths occurs globally because of APH. And in South Africa, obstetric hemorrhage was the third most important cause, accounting to 12.4% of all deaths. Then hemorrhage emerges as a major cause for severe maternal morbidity. So not only mortality, but we also come across a lot of morbidity in these women with APH. So by definition, it is defined as the bleeding from or in the genital tract that happens occurs after 24 weeks of pregnancy or prior to the birth of a baby. The most important causes of APH are placenta previa and placental abruption. APH complicates 3 to 5% of the pregnancies and it is the leading cause of perinatal and maternal mortality worldwide. And the causes for APH commonly it is the placenta previa and abrasio placenta and occasionally it can be vaso previa. And there are certain uncommon causes like rupture of uterus, unexplained uh, vaginal bleeding, lesions from vagina or the cervix like a polyp. Uh, or some lesions in the vagina or it can even be malignancy or local trauma and varicose veins. So by definition, abruptio placenta means the separation of placenta either partially or totally from its implantation site before delivery. The incidence is about 0.5% to 1% and it is about one case in around 200 deliveries. The pathophysiology is it can be two ways, acute placental abruption, which will manifest as a acute emergency. And there is also another entity called as chronic placental abruption. So the rupture of decidual spiral artery and hemorrhage into the decidual bacillus occurs. The subsequent expanding of the retroplacental hematoma splits the decidual and leaves a thin layer of adherent to that of the myometrium. The decidual hematoma grows and it lifts away and compresses the adjacent placenta. Hematoma may be small or self-limited and may continue to decide throughout the decidual layer that releases thromboplastins and bleeding into the myometrium causing cubular uterus. So the chronic placental abruption is due to chronic placental ischemia that presents with recurrent bleeding episode. In some cases, chronic abruption and oligohydramnios develop and it is called as chronic abruption oligohydramnios sequence. Later in pregnancy, Hemorrhage with retroplacental hematoma is occasionally arrested and completely uh, arrested completely without delivery. They may have abnormality 
in the form of elevated levels of uh, AFP or placental specific RNAs as markers of this event. No coagulation abnormalities are seen in this type of chronic placental abruption, but most often the fetuses will be growth retarded because of, and there will be oligohydramnios. What is the frequency of placental abruption, placenta previa by maternal age? As the maternal age increases, the incidence of placenta previa also goes up. And abruption of placenta after 35 years, it may go up slightly higher, but not up to the incidence of placenta previa. And frequency of placental abruption by the gestational age. See, in initially less than 28 weeks, it can happen to 11.7%. But as the gestational Gestational age increases, it may go up to 22.5% at between 38 and 39 weeks of gestation. So the risk factors, all are aware, prior oppression is a high risk factor, increased age and parity, preeclampsia, chronic hypertension, chorea amnionitis, premature rupture of membranes, multifetal gestation, low birth weight, hydramnia, cigarette smoking, single umbilical artery, cocaine use, uterine leomyoma and subchorionic hematoma. So again, this uh, inadequate decidualization because of increased maternal age where there is multiple previous metal, multiple pregnancies or uh, previous uh, multiparous women, there, there can be inadequate decidualization and then uterine anomalies and fibroids and vasospasm and placental hypoperfusion as it occurs in hypertensive disorders, thrombophilias, smoking and cocaine use. Then other risk factors are sudden compression of the uterus due to polyhydramnios, PPROM and multifetal gestation and shearing of the placental vessels as it occurs in abdominal trauma or external cephalic inversion, which is very rarely done nowadays. Others are in lower socioeconomic status. It is three times higher seen in the black, folate deficiency and increased second trimester serum alpha phytoprotein and then increased risk of this shows uh, higher the alpha phytoprotein level, there is increased risk of uh, abruption. So the types are revealed. It is 80% of the patient, the pa it, it will present with features of pain and bleeding. And it may be concealed in 20% where the patient may have severe pain and land up in shock and DIC. You don't have the bleeding externally, but it goes, it separates the placenta and it gets into the myometrium and then there may be profuse bleeding which will lead to conceptive coagulopathy. Or it can be a mixed pattern where there may be a partial revealed and partial concealed. So now grading of the placental abruption is, it can be asymptomatic as, seen, as, as it is called as grade zero. Only we recognize it after the delivery, we see the rate of placental clots. Then second one is grade one is mild vaginal bleeding, mild PV, mild uterine irritability, no fetal or maternal compromise. And the rate of placental clot may be around 150 ml. Moderate or concealed or revealed, it could be either way in moderate, where the vaginal bleeding is more and uterine hypertonicity, Tenderness, signs of fetal distress, maternal tachycardia and orthostatic hypotension. Hypofibrinogenemia can happen. The level of fibrinogen goes down to 150 to 250 milligrams per deciliter and the retroplacental clot may even go up to 500 ml. And in third uh, grading, it is heavy or, ab or absent vaginal bleeding as in the case of concealed hemorrhage. There is marked uterine tetany and tenderness, fetal demise, maternal shock, coagulopathy, acute kidney injury and Severe hypofibrinogenemia and retroplacental clot may be 1000 ml and it can again be divided into 3A and 3B where 3A is the coagulopathy is associated and 3B is where there is fetal demise. The clinical features are vaginal bleed, severe pain abdomen that mimics a normal labor but it differs from the normal labor that it is persistent. It is severely tender and tense uterus. And there may be backache when there is posterior placenta, previa, and decreased fetal movements. And sometimes, uh, rarely, it can be asymptomatic. The signs are pallor, tachycardia, ecchymosis, petechia in the presence of coagulopathy. BP may be increased or normal or lower. Pundal height may be greater than the period of gestation. Uterine tenderness and uterine tone is very much high. Difficulty in palpating the fetal parts because of the tense tender uterus. And the liquor will be blood stained. And recurrent late or variable deceleration in CTG with a poor B2B -B variability and prolonged bradycardia and sinusoidal pattern are seen. Post delivery placental examination will show, invariably show a rate placental clot. The investigations are basic investigations of CBC, blood group, urine analysis, RFT, LFT, 
and serum fibrinogen clotting time, clot retraction time, coagulation profile, DIC profile should be done. And ultrasonogram is a common bedside investigation which can help us to rule out placenta previa and to some extent we can pick up the retroplacental clot formation in the case of abruptio placenta. So this is the ultrasonographic picture where you can see the early retroplacental hematoma that may be seen as a hyperechoic or a isoechoic area. This is the area or it can be the hematoma can be retroplacental or preplacental or subchorionic. Then intrauterine clot may jiggle when sudden pressure is observed over if you keep a pressure with a transputer, transducer upon the abdomen, there may be uh, jiggling of this uh, uh, intrauterine clot that is called as the jellocyne and heterogeneous placental thickness. The placental thickness may vary from one, one area to the other area. And uh, how do you, once when you diagnose, how we are going to manage? Send for the investigation, resuscitate the patient, stabilize the patient and assess the amount of blood loss. Use a wide bar cannula and IV fluids, preferably crystallites and colloids can be used and uh, uh, catheterization of the bladder is a must to assess the urinary output and if needed, continue, uh, CVP monitoring can be done and better these patients are, once when they are detected early uh, period itself, it is better to shift them to a center where you can have the uh, multidisciplinary management and continuous uh, fetal monitoring should be done and we have to arrange for the blood and the blood product. Subsequent management depends upon the fetal condition, gestational age, uterine contraction and rupture of membrane. Management options can be either an immediate termination, whether if the patient is uh, has some amount of uh, cervical dilatation, then we can attempt a vaginal delivery with, uh, by doing an early ARM. Usually the labor will be progressing very rapidly or if there is no uh, cervix is not taken up or is closed, then that means it is an indication for cesarean section. Expected management can be followed up in a very, very rare condition where the patient is stable and there may be a small retroplacental clot after which it settles down. The patient is, it is always better to keep the patient in the hospital under care and we need to tell the patient and get the consent that any, any time she can bleed and we have to terminate the uh, baby. So then vaginal delivery indications are if the fetus is alive with an off normal FHR pattern and delivery is imminent but when the fetus is dead but maternal condition is stable, labor usually proceeds rapidly augmented by ARM and oxytocin. Prophylactic eutrotonics after the placental delivery is very very important because we need to anticipate PPH in cases, all cases with APH and better to go for a, uh, a good eutrotonic support. Then in cesarean section, what are the indications when the baby is alive and mature and delivery is not imminent and if maternal condition is unstable and does not respond to resuscitative measure, when there is fetal distress, failure to progress during labor and if LSES is re required, then we have to first identify whether she has gone in for any DIC and then correct it. Parallelly, we have to correct DIC at the same time we have to plan delivery. Expected management, I said it is very, very rare. Marginal abruption when the fetus is less than 34 weeks with no maternal complication and good fetal surveillance test or normal. Maybe we can go for it. And ideally, the aim is to prolong gestation, close monitoring of the maternal condition with the blood pressure, amount of bleeding, frequent assessment, assessment of maternal hematological parameters and coagulation profile are needed. Close fetal surveillance with non-stress test and biophysical profile and growth assessment and administration of steroids and maybe we can deliver by 37 to 38. I think in this uh, era, I think it is safe to deliver even much earlier than that when the, pay, when the baby crosses just 34 weeks of gestation. Tocolysis, though textbooks are telling that tocolysis can be given, I am totally against this because tocolysis in turn, it is going to... Um, you propagate the abruption and the patient will land up with severe complication. So ultimately, the algorithm for management is when the patient is near term, fetus alive, reassuring status, vaginal delivery, contraindication to vaginal delivery on non-reassuring fetal status, unstable mother, cesarean delivery. If the fetus is again then we can go for a vaginal delivery, but always monitor for the maternal uh, distress also and in unstable mother, cesarean delivery is ideal. So then, in a case of abruption with the preterm labor, if the fetus is alive, pre-viable, and if the mother is mother is unstable, deliver. 
if the mother is stable, manage conservatively, and then in uh, if the fetus is alive greater than 28 weeks, assess non-assuring fetal status or unstable mother deliver, or if the fetus is dead, deliver, or on assessing beyond 28 weeks, if there is a reassuring fetal status and a stable mother, maybe conservative management, we can take, take up to 37 to 38 weeks. I will say 34 to 36 weeks is sufficient. Maternal complications are the patient can land up, land up with a hypovolemic shock with the blood, which might require massive blood transfusion, conceptive coagulopathy, cubular uterus or uteroplacental apoplexy, re acute kidney injury, postpartum hemorrhage, amniotic fluid embolism, and fetal maternal hemorrhage, pulmonary edema, puerperal sepsis, postpartum anemia, Sheehan syndrome. In long term, the risk of premature cardiovascular disease is higher. Any antipartum event, what we see in the mother, that is a warning sign that the patient is likely to land up with a premature cardiovascular disease uh, at a later stage. And maternal mortality can be up to 1% and morbidity can be still even higher. The cuvular uterus is where there is a total placental abruption after the delivery you see the blood that is uh, stripping through the myometal tissue and infiltrates the myometrium to reach the serosa. The, again, the neonatal complications. Here the neonatal, see, but uh, one thing we must understand is cubular uterus is not an indication for cesarean hysterectomy because most often it responds to the uterotonics. And even if it is atonic, we can control it by putting B-Lynch or some of the compressive sutures can help in these situations. Then neonatal complications are because of prematurity and fetal growth restriction, abnormal neonatal hematology, transient coagulopathy. In surviving infants, long-term urological sequelae like cerebral palsy is high, mild abrupt show, prematurity, low birth weight, IUGR, hyperbilirubinemia, and higher perinatal mortality can happen due to prematurity. Even at the at term, the perinatal mortality is 25-fold 25, 25 higher with abruption. A decision to delivery interval of 20 minutes is reduce the incidence of poor outcome. So the moment if you identify abruption, if the fetus is all right and the, the mother is, uh, um, I mean, uh, I have given the indication earlier, if the fetus is all right with the normal favorable cervix, we can allow for a vaginal delivery. Otherwise, it is always safer to go for a cesarean section as early as possible that can reduce the perinatal and the maternal mortality and the morbidity. 50% of the deaths are often stillbirths as far as the neonatal, uh, neonatal uh, neonates are concerned. Recurrent abortion, recurrent uh, abruption, sorry, recurrence of subsequent pregnancy, the abruption rate is about 5 to 17%. 25% if two pregnancies had previous two pregnancies with abruption. Recurrent abruption occurs one to three weeks earlier and it may be sudden even remote from term. So we have to be very careful. Start watching the patient with the previous history of abruption four weeks earlier to the previous incidence of abruption. So management in the subsequent pregnancy is no intervention was found to reduce the risk except for some amount of folic acid intake, quit smoking, Hypertension, if the patient has got, it has to be controlled before and during the subsequent pregnancy. And thromboprophylaxis with aspirin, heparin, who, who are found to have screen positive. Serial growth scans are needed every four weeks. Six weeks of observation before gestational age of initial passion abruption with a preterm delivery. History of two or more abruption. Consider delivery at 37 weeks. Then coming to the second half, that is the placenta previa. Now, normally, the placenta is situated in the fundus, either anterior or posterior. And the low-lying placenta, it is, it is the placenta is in the lower segment, or sometimes it may not, it may extend up to the internal os, or it may cover the entire internal os, causing placenta previa. And by definition, placenta that is implanted are the, somewhere in the lower uterine segment, either over or very near the internal cervical os. And the incident varies from 0.4% or one case for 250 to 400 deliveries, the incidence of placenta previa is on the increase due to increasing previous LSCS. Higher the number of previous LSCS, then higher the incidence of placenta previa. And again, placenta accreta are found to be more common whenever there is placenta previa. The pathogenesis is placenta normally implants in the area of good blood supply and decidualization, which is usually the uterine fundus. But suboptimal decidualization or blood supply to the upper segment can be responsible for implantation in the lower uterine segment. 
Also, the placenta extends to the lower uterine seg segment when the surface area of the placenta is quite large, that is especially as it happens in multiple pregnancy. Again, in patients with ART, the incidence of placental abnormalities, that is placenta previa is going to be high. And whenever there is increased myometrial contractility, that can also lead to um, uh, placenta previa. The risk factors are advanced maternal age, ART, smoking, one previous section, two, three, greater than three, and history of placenta previa, past history and multiple pregnancy. And 2.2% uh, incidence is seen among the multiparous women, and uh, the previous history of abortion also increases. So the low-lying placenta uh, leading to placental age within the two centimeters from the maternal, uh, internal, sorry, internal loss but not covering it. Placenta previa, that is placenta is covering the whole of the internal loss. So it is a complete placenta previa where the internal loss is covered and uh, uh, it is partial when it is extending up to the internal loss but not fully covering and marginal, it is somewhere similar to that but not crossing over the internal loss and low lying when it is about 2 centimeters away from that of the internal loss. Older classification is type 1 low-lying, type 2 marginal, type 3 partial, and type 4 is total or complete placenta previa. And there can be minor placenta previa of type 1 and 2 and major placenta previa when it is type 3 and type 4. So uh, why we should classify this? Because this helps in planning the mode of delivery. In minor placenta previa in type 1 and type 2 anterior, maybe we can try for a vaginal delivery. But in rest of the cases, and especially when it is associated with the uh, Akrita syndrome, we have to go only for a planned elective uh, section. Then about coming to placental migration. 90% of the patients who are found to have placenta previa in the se second trimester, they resolve by term. There is placental migration or it is called a stroke trophism and it is not a true migration. Actually, it is because of the differential growth of the upper and the lower uterine segment. Growth of the placenta implanted in the lower segment more towards the up vascular upper segment along with the atrophy of the distal part or it can depend upon the gestational age and diagnosis, early diagnosis, the more chances will be. Extent covering the internal loss. If the placenta is found to cover the internal loss, then the chances of migration are going to be less. An anterior placenta wall placenta is less likely to migrate than that of the posterior wall. And rate of placental migration is 0.1 millimeter per week when it covers the os, or 4.1 millimeter per week when the placental age is greater than 3 centimeters. The clinical features or the symptoms are usually it will be a painless vaginal bleeding due to shearing forces of the placental attachment to the lower uterine segment associated with the development of lower ones when the lower uterine segment starts developing at the third, third trimester and when the uterine contractions are to dilate the cervix, then the placenta can start bleeding and it is provoked by digital vaginal examination. Maybe it is associated with the preterm contractions and malpresentation. The signs are maternal discomfort like tachycardia, hypotension, depending amount of amount, amount of blood loss, anemia, uterus is relaxed unless the patient is in labor, abnormal lie and presentation. Presenting head may be high and or it may be an abnormal presentation. No difficulty in palpating the Fetal parts as regards to this uh, abruptio placentae where the uterus is tense and tender and we may not be able to palpate the fetal parts. Fetal heart will be present usually and if the bleeding is not extensive. Stalwarthy sign is non-specific. We generally say whenever there is a placenta okay. is occurring in the posterior placenta previa type 2, the, uh, whenever there is uterine contraction, there may be variation in the fetal heart rate that is called a Stalwarthy sign but we don't give significance to that. On, on high presenting part or an abnormal light, irrespective of the previous imaging result, it, you can, uh, when you do a speculum examination, sometimes we see the low-lying placenta or the placental tissues jetting through the os. And the investigations are as usual, we are dependent. The gold standard is only transabdominal or transvaginal or tra transperineal sonography. Transabdominal ultrasonogram majority are diagnosed during the routine ultrasonogram between 18 to 22 weeks and usually the placental localization is done simultaneously. But again, when it is found to be at 18 to 22 weeks, as there is growth and the differential uh, migration of this placenta, it can ascend up. False positive results occur due to full bladder, anterior and posterior uterine walls are compressed together by the bladder. Fetal head may obscure the views of lower placental 
Age and false negative results can happen. High BMI, posterior placenta previa may sometimes be difficult to visualize. In all cases of placenta previa, color Doppler should be performed to exclude placenta accreta. So here it is a transabdominal root. The placenta previa, you can see the cervix here and the fetal head and the entire placenta is covering the internal house. So whenever there is an over-distended uterus, there may be a in a over-distended uterus, you see, it may appear as though the placenta is covering the os. The same patient, after emptying the bladder, there may not be evidence of any placenta previa. And again, transvaginal scan is more accurate. And I am very fond of doing this transvaginal scan in placenta previa with the higher resolution. And it is very safe to do a gentle uh, positioning of the probe can identify the uh, location, exact location, whether it is anterior or posterior or whether it is a covering the internal os or external os. So otherwise, when further tra um, transvaginal ultrasonogram is required, when the women come with bleeding or asymptomatic suspected minor previa at 36 weeks, asymptomatic suspected major placenta previa at 32 weeks, we can identify and the accreta syndrome is better identified by a transvaginal color flow mapping that can help us to plan uh, delivery. Transperineal and translabial ultrasonogram are also or also alternates to transvaginal. MRI is another important uh, uh, gadget in diagnosing placenta previa where we suspect the placenta accreta syndrome. Then how to manage? Initial management when the patient presents with bleeding is admit the patient, assess the general condition and assess the amount of bleeding, resuscitate with fluids either normal serine or oral, blood sampling, cross-matching, Catheterization, complete bladder drainage to assess the urine output, then ultrasound for uh, placental localization and fetal assessment. All this can be done simultaneously. Then expected management, that is McAfee Johnson's regime, where he aims to prolong the pregnancy, reduce the prematurity and perinatal mortality. When do you plan for expected management? Placenta previa with bleeding before term. Major degrees of placenta previa, if there is no bleeding, patient is hemodynamically stable. We can advise the patient to be as an inpatient uh, with a taking uh, bed rest and transfusion support, periodic assessment of the uh, hemogram so that uh, the hemoglobin level is maintained. Steroids to be given before 34 weeks and magnesium sulfate if the baby is planned to deliver less than 32 weeks. Close maternal and fetal monitoring are needed. Active management of uh, placenta previa is if any one of the following exists. For example, if the patient has crossed 37 weeks or four, ideal is planned pregnant delivery of the fetus uh, by cesarean section is needed. If fetus is dead and major malformation of the fetus is also there, then we need to deliver the uh, baby. Or when there is profuse bleeding, causing hemodynamic instability, or when the patient is in labor, we have to go for active management. Inpatient versus outpatient treatment. No further bleeding. You are admitting the patient at say at 28 weeks of gestation with a placenta previa low lying. Then once when there is four, no further bleeding, consider outpatient management, telling her her reach to the hospital should be as early as possible whenever she experiences a second episode of bleeding. No difference in fetal and maternal morbidity and mortality rates are identified. Outpatient management is cost effective, reduces the hospitalization. Women with major pre placenta previa who have previously bed should be admitted and managed as inpatient right from 34 weeks. And with major women with major placenta previa who remain asymptomatic, having never bled, require careful counseling before contemplating outpatient treatment. Then any home-based care requires close proximity to the house, uh, to the hospital. That is what I said. They should be reachable to the hospital at any time and constant presence of a companion with a fully informed consent from the patient is needed. Women should attend the hospital immediately within 15 minutes to 30 minutes in case of bleeding or contraction or pain or discomfort. Non-compliant patient should not be managed as, should be managed definitely as inpatient and not given the option of OPD management. In prolonged inpatient care, prophylactic anticoagulation should be reserved for those with a high risk of thromboembolism. Tocolysis, again, Significant prolongation of the pregnancy can happen. 
significant increase in the birth weight and no adverse maternal or fetal outcome. Associated tachycardia may mask maternal condition and data are sparse regarding the use of tocolytic administration. Generally, in our clinical practice, we do not go for a tocolytic thing. Examination of oper operating group. This is what we call as, call it as a double setup. It is indicated when ultrasound evidence of placenta previa is inconclusive. Facilities for emergency placental localization are not available. Should be done only when delivery is planned. Full setup of LSES, blood supply, star, blood um, staffs, and second obstetrician who is scrubbed and gone. And we should have a good support care without anesthesia, possibly or with possibility of epidural. Uh, you can proceed uh, for, where we can proceed for surgery soon after without any delay. The procedure is bladder should be catheterized. Each vaginal fornix is pal palpated gently to feel for the plus presence of placenta and uh, bogginess should, can be felt. If the furnaces are empty, then we can introduce finger to the cervical os or rather than inserting the cervical os, we can put in a speculum and see whether the placental tissue are seen or not. Rupture of the membranes for vaginal delivery, if there is no placental tissue is felt, placental edge is anteriorly felt, does not extend to the os, no bleeding is provoked, then, uh, then rupture of membranes can be done and patient can be planned for vaginal delivery. If brisk vaginal bleeding starts occurring at any stage of the procedure, then immediate cesarean section should be done. So ultimately, the management is, the algorithm is, placenta previa or low-lying placenta on routine 18 to 22 weeks ultrasound examination, if you find, follow up the patient. Examine at, re-examine re at 32 weeks. If there is no placenta previa, then routine prenatal care is given. If there is placenta previa with a low-lying placenta without accreta, follow up the patient with a transvaginal ultrasonogram up to 36 weeks. And again, if on follow-up, if there is no placenta previa, go to the routine. And if there is placenta previa, you can schedule planned delivery at 37 plus weeks of gestation. And if it is low-lying placenta, maybe we can go for an expected or a trial of labor. Or on the other hand, if it is found to have a placenta accreta syndrome, then we have to plan, get it planned at 34 plus weeks and a probability of cesarean section hysterectomy should be discussed and it should be done better in a center of excellence and a center of multidisciplinary center. Antenatal discussions regarding the possibility of transfusion, cesarean delivery, hemorrhage, hysterectomy should be counseled to the patient and the family. And the need for cesarean hysterectomy should also be told. And delivery should be conducted by a senior experienced obstetrician along with experienced anesthetist. Blood should be researched. Four units of cross match blood should be ready, even if the mother has never experienced vaginal bleeding. And timing is uncomplicated placenta previa 36 to 37 weeks, symptomatic 34 to 35 weeks. Mode of delivery placed on the clinical and ultrasound findings. We can go for a cesarean delivery or in an anterior. A type 1, maybe we can go for a early ARM and delivery. And uh, uh, fetal head, the two, only when the fetal head is engaged. As we do the ARM, this head descends and it acts as a tamponade and then bleeding may be uh, reduced. So then active management of labor. Here, postpartum bleeding is very, very common due to the non retractile lower uterine segment where there is a large placental site, retained placenta and morbid adherence can be seen. And there can be sometimes laceration in the fragile cervix and the lower uterine segment. And there is increased risk of manual removal of placenta. Cord should be clamped as early as possible. And a cesarean in a placenta previa, ideally regional thing is used. And you can go for a vertical, lower vertical uh, section uh, if uh, LUS is lower uterine segment is not formed or when it is vascular or anterior placenta. And uh, in anterior placenta, there are two approaches. One is cutting through the placenta, or uh, uh, risk of significant fetal and maternal uh, blood loss. And it should be done with a senior consultant who is uh, very rapid in his, uh, in her or uh, his uh, uh, action. Defining placental age, going through the membranes above and below the placenta, that is what's technique, undue delay in delivery, sometimes hemorrhage from the partially separated placenta can happen. Then again, both approaches may be associated with profuse bleeding. So following placental removal, there may be plosive bleeding from the lower uterine segment, which can be controlled with the, with the administration of low uterotonics may not help to control the bleeding in the lower uterine segment, but patient might need a hemostatic mattress suturing, compression suturing, tamponades using, using folis bulb or buckley bulb, and other surgical techniques are de-stepwise devascularization and pelvic artery 
embolization. If these conservative methods fail, bleeding is brisk, a brisk quick hysterectomy can be necessary. But in cases of uh, multiparous women with the placenta previa and or centrally covering, as uh, Dr. Bets uh, Betsy has given a clear cut, you can go for a vertical incision, deliver the placenta, and then go for a cesarean hysterectomy. Leaving behind the placenta in the current uh, uh, period is, uh, I do, uh, the, there are a lot of complications, sepsis, damage, giving methotrexate can harm. So these are all the problems and maternal complications can be shock, preterm labor, PPH, C-section, increased incident, increased amniotic fluid embolism, postpartum sepsis, placenta accreta and maternal mor morbidity and mortality. So here again, I would like to add a few points with the thromboelastography, that is, Thromboelastography is a simple bedside test. In patients with a, a massive uh, bleeding disorder, we are in a status what things should be given, whether we need to give the antifibrinolytics or whether we need to give the blood and the bread products or the platelets. All those things can be done within a few minutes using this um, thromboelastography. This is a normal picture where it is the reaction time, achievement of skirt clot uh, form, um, firmness, then maximum amplitude, maximum strength of the clot, this is, and then persistent lysis. Uh, uh, this, this is a phase of coagulation. This is a phase of fibrinolysis. So in a normal patient, it is li likely the graph will be like this. But in patients with uh, factor deficiency or anticoagulant hemophilia, there may be this R and K may be prolonged and there may be the angle may be the angle. This angle may be decreased. So it will be in this pattern. Platelet blockers, that is in thrombocytopenia, the pattern will be like this. In fibrinolysis, it will be like this pattern. In hypercoagulable state, this R and K are reduced and there may be widening. This angle may be increased. And in DAC, you see in stage 1, hypercoagulable state with secondary fibrinolysis. In stage 2, it is hypocoagulable state with uh, uh, fibrinolysis. So accordingly, whether it is in the, whether we lack this platelets, we can give this. Whether it is fibrinolysis or uh, whether it is a hypofibrinogenemia, we can correct by supplementing with the product. Then coming to the last one, the fetus is not without complication, prematurity, malpresentation, hypoxia, FGR, congenital anomalies, and perinatal morbid, mortality and morbidity is more common. Then uh, other rare conditions are vasopria, which is very, very rare. And we can see the fetal blood vessels traversing the membranes over the cervix. And when it starts bleeding, the fetus is going to be at risk. And we have to, the hardest factors are second trimester low lying placenta, placental abnormalities like bilo placenta, success rate low. And in IVF and with multiple pregnancy, previa can be identified as seen. And clinical importance is perinatal mortality is very high. Rupture of fetal vessels called cause complete exsanguination of the fetus and fetal death. Pressure on fetal vessels by presenting part can lead to asphyxia. So it is only a retrospective diagnosis. Membranes rupture with the vaginal bleeding and sudden uh, onset of fetal heart irregularities. We have to think about vasopria. And uh, amnioscopy can help in identifying this. So uh, these are all the uh, ultrasonogram with the color Doppler can identify some of the vessels running across. And this is the management of selective C-section where you can see this vessels traversing the membrane here. And here also the after the delivery of the placenta. So uh, apart from this, we can have some so sort of unexplained bleeding that can also any bleeding in the antenatal period that causes maternal morbidity and mortality and as well as high risk of developing perinatal mortality and mortal morbidity. And thank you for the opportunity given. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Anjalakshmi, madam. Ninga, unmute panikang, madam. Anjalakshmi, madam. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Ramani. Uh, it was an elaborate talk and it is a total revision for all postgraduates. Yes, okay. Madam. Uh, I was happy when you mentioned about the solver design <laughs> and also <laughs> the metaphase uh, expectant line of management. Okay. And uh, yes, see, in the in abruption, I just um, disagree with you regarding the expectant line of management because the abruption delivery interval is very, very important to avoid the complications. So patients will have pain at home and the, by the time they reach the medical facility, it would be late. Okay. Yes. It is very rare and exceptional. The expectant line of management is very rare and in the exceptional cases. 
we can have in, in I abruption. accept with you madam yes. very ah. very early minimal abruption yes. that can yeah, that yeah. we can that is a sort it is given as a yeah. chronic yeah. abruption yeah. but yeah. generally we come across that, only that is a, abruption um, so that Many is that, uh, that type of thing goes unnoticed okay. or yes, yes. yeah 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 okay and uh, next thing is um, the word technique you have nicely explained and the thromboelastography and now the facility is available in all the hospitals teaching institutions so the post it is the duty of the post graduate to learn because we are not aware of it actually so now the recent post graduates they are lucky to have this thromboelastography they should learn about this and try to utilize that and one more thing is in cases of both abruption and placenta previa you have to continue the uh, utero tonic at least for 24 hours because yes. suddenly the abruption uh, uterus can relax and start bleeding postpartum hemorrhage can occur okay and then a pubular uterus hysterectomy is not the rule it can contract it can yes. contract with the stimulus with the massage and the putting the warm packs and all it will contract and you can save the uterus so the unnecessary hysterectomy should be avoided so that is why i nice. wanted to stress that madam right uh, was nicely presented, uh, uh, Ramani. Thank you very and, much. Uh, re, in the reason, I like to tell uh, Ramani. Actually, uh, vaginal delivery uh, for intrauterine uh, death. When I mean uh, fetal death in a case of abruptio. No, no, no. Death, death, it is. Yeah, you also. Just, uh, if the uh, uh, baby has gone, two thirds of the placenta is separated. All the yeah, yeah, yeah. Be very, very. You have to, you have to empty yes, the madam. Uterine. That all depends upon yes, whether the vaginal is very favorable and yes. very much in the going to imminent so delivery. In the, in, the, in the birth of the delivery only, you can. Allow otherwise mm. the, uh, the uterus has to be emptied immediately as early as possible. That, uh, it should be immediately emptied, so that yes. should be the rule. Okay, yeah, only okay. when it is a favorable one mm. and mm. the delivery is very imminent, that is less than mm. half an hour, we yeah. can allow. Otherwise, yes, yes. if we can deliver abdominally within half an hour, that will be the best one. And recently, ah. there was a very nice paper presentation on thromboelastography by. Madurai Medical College postgraduates at uh, Vice President ah. Conference at uh, Kodekanal, madam. Okay, okay. And uh, they ah. had uh, saved many of the patients what mm. uh, supplementation, what product, mm. what product mm. they should mm. give at what time. And that's what all the postgraduates should be thorough with that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, ma. Thank, thank you. you. The machine oh, is available in the OG department or in the yeah. cardiology? Yeah. Where no, yes, no, madam. it is available in the, available in the OG in department. The OG department. department in the ICU. In the ICU, it is available. Okay. 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 Ma'am, there is a question. Uh, hmm. How will you manage a case of lethal malformation or IUD with a complete placenta previa in second trimester? In second trimester. Second, second trimester. IUD yeah. or lethal malformation? Complete hmm. previa. Okay. IUD, already IUD. Yes. So, so the it, placenta would have gone. And oh, undergone necrosis. Madam, I had a similar case like this. Hmm. Hmm. That was around 16 weeks of gestation with an and kephali. Okay. What hmm. I did was I gave her shots of five shots of methotrexate with folinic acid. Hmm. Okay. Then hmm. the placenta came out, separated hmm. on its own and came out along hmm. with the baby. Okay. See here, they can wait for a few more days monitoring the circulation profile. Yes. And then I'll remove it vaginally. Okay. Yes. I'll terminate vaginally. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. 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 Thank who are going to take uh, who are going to take us through the assorted selection of case scenarios dr sumna manohar is the head of department at senior consultant obstetrician and gynecologist at apollo women's hospital chennai current south zone aiccrcog chair has many publications in national and international journals and is the current apaj scientific chair 2024 dr deepa tangamani is a consultant at apollo first med hospital chennai Consultant at Thamarai Fertility Solution Exclusives Chennai. She's the Joint Secretary of ATN RCOG 
Advisory Committee OXI 2023 to 2024 and Chairperson OXI Midlife Committee 2023 to 2024. And she has many achievements to her name. Um, the panelists with us today are Dr. Gomati. She's a professor of obstetrics and gynecology, Keel Park Medical College, experience of over 30 years. She's also a consultant at Surya Hospital and Kaveri Hospital. Um, her specific field of interest is high-risk obstetrics and has a number of national and international journal publications. Dr. Meera Raghavan, um, she's a consultant urogynecologist and robotic surgeon at Apollo Hospitals Chennai and the Chennai Specialty Clinic. She has many accolades to her name. And the one thing that I would love to say about her, she's a winner of 32 gold medals in her undergrad and the best outgoing uh, PG student of uh, Chandigarh. Dr. Nidhi Sharma, she's a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Savita University. Um, she's a fellow of the Indian College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, fellow of uh, ART, and has done a diploma in IVF and reproductive medicine at Germany. She has, um, has over 100 indexed national and international publication and has authored several chapters in textbooks. We have a Professor uh, Sailata Ma'am. She's an undergrad has done her undergraduation in Bangalore Medical College, post graduation in Mysore Medical College. She's a professor of Department of Obzingaini in Chetnad Academy of Research and Education for the past ten years. She has served in the Indian Navy as a graded specialist in obstetrics and gynecology before joining this institute. And she's the president of IMA Kalambakam branch. Dr. Venela is a consultant anesthetologist at Apollo Women's Hospital, Chennai. She um, you know, worked in the UK for 11 years before relocating to India in 2011. She was a consultant at uh, Kove Medical uh, Center, Coimbatore, and Apollo Main Hospital, Chennai. She's a lead consultant anesthetist at Apollo Cradle Women's Hospital, and she's involved in setting up emergency medical cover team and level two critical care unit for the isolated single specialty hospital, apart from anesthesia and preoperative, uh, perioperative uh, services. Dr. Meghna Matthew is currently working as an intensivist and pulmonologist at Apollo First Med Hospital, Chennai. She's graduated from CMC Vellore, uh, pulmonary medicine from National Board of uh, Examination, New Delhi, and member of Indian so uh, Chess Society and Indian Society of Critical Me Care Medicine. She's a certified American Heart Association provider and instructor of BLS and ACLS and serves as a faculty in the simulation-based programs afford, uh, uh, offered through TACT Academy of Clinical Training. Over to you all for the panel today, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Just give us two, two seconds. seconds. Okay. Desktop. Desktop. I will test it. Optimus. Well, it's not coming once again. Uh, Chitrakala, can you help on the sharing? Uh, yes, it's difficulty. Uh, when you click share screen, what it is showing, ma'am? No, when we share it, it doesn't say everything. It says it's like a, a open system preferences. Okay. Uh, see. Open, uh, there are some things, I mean, basic and advanced files like that it is showing, ma'am? Uh, uh, see, uh, basic advanced, it shows we are in the basic. Uh, yes, ma'am. In that, if you open the PPT, it will show the preview, ma'am. It's not showing anything in the basic. Uh, screen, it is showing screen, ma'am. 
it's showing the screen uh, click okay. on the screen and share ma'am it's not sharing uh, chitra basic for me deepak here share illa you have an arrow and green color share click on it no yeah go down no uh, that that we are doing it but it is not we are not able to share this then go, close it and come back again okay we'll close everything in we can or else ask to try to share uh, give it to her ma'am it's a panel yeah mm. you can keep talking <laughs> oh mira va chitra paare can share chitra can share namare ayir pon namme it's not uh, oh, okay that basically then just uh, powerpoint okay. panna seru you have reduced the ppt la open ah, it reduce the ppt adukapram kida screen sir illiya we have done everything but it is now when we share screen what we are seeing is only the uh, virtual background kind of thing it's coming chitrakala some zoom idu uh, enna pandradhukka i am calling deepa ma'am enna ma screen sharing screen sharing um, this is what we are getting it chitra okay um uh, mam kile no options irukku mam bara share ne varliya mam and share varudhu but share varudha da madam is doing something click panni paarenga mam and share click panna open preference varudhu ipo avanga mail la anupalama she says at least we can start off and then get speaking right idha first time share pandreengala mam in the system la madam idha first time she share pandreenga no no madam has done it before okay you might have to open preferences la enna mari options kaatudha mam i can't read actually one second madam is doing something okay If you change settings, you need to log out and log in once again. Oh, okay. One second, one second. Can you tell me, Mama? Log in that way, can I say that? Okay. திருப்பி லாக் அவுட் பண்ணிட்டு பண்ணலாம் லீவ் கொடுத்துட்டு மார்க்கே வேணும் ஜாயின் பண்ணி பாருங்க மேம் லீவ் கொடுத்துட்டு பண்ண சொல்லுங்க ஆ யா இட்ஸ் 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 ஷேரிங் ஆ ஷேரிங் ஓகே இட் ஸ்டார்ட்டட் ஷேரிங் பிபிடி போடுங்க பட் ஸ்கிரீன் ஓ தெரியல பட் ஸ்டார்ட்டட் ன்னு வந்துருச்சு மேம் பிபிடி வந்து போய் ஆ யா இட்ஸ் கமிங் Mm, yeah okay sorry about this <laughs> slide share yeah this is yeah um now i invite uh, gomati dr gomati dr meera raghavan nidhi sharma sai latta venilla and megana for this panel so we have a 40 year old uh, gravida 3 in her uh, fourth pregnancy uh, having had three babies in a primary health care with a bmi of 36 and at 39 weeks had a normal delivery she delivered 4.1 kilo baby after delivery uh, she had a brisk vaginal bleed uh, and then placenta and membranes were complete and there were no uh, genital lacerations and her uterus is very flaccid because of the obesity we could not really find whether the uterus was flaccid or contracted minimal tone regain in spite of uterine massage 
Dr. Gomati, can you tell me, is she a high risk for PPH and would you be prepared to uh, get uh, all your uh, equipment and uh, the medications ready? Uh, yes, ma'am, definitely she's a case, a high, case of a high risk pregnancy because she is one is 36 years and uh, she's a fourth gravida uh, and, uh, and the baby expected fetal weight is 4 kg. So definitely she's a case of high risk. And uh, better, this patient has to be delivered at a high risk center rather than in a PHC. So that we'll do all the facilities to prevent everything and treat whenever she develops PPH. She should not yeah. be delivered at a PHC. So we know, uh, so, you know the, the, she is a high risk for PPH. Yes. So we have to well equipped uh, yes. with this. So Dr. Nidhi, how can you prevent it happening? Uh, what are the preventive measures for uh, PPH and what are the ones which are really well established? Dr. Nidhi? Dr. Nidhi Sharma? Dr. Can you take this uh, uh, question, Dr. Sailata? Uh, yes, madam. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yeah. I can. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if I've anticipated uh, PPH in this lady, I would have, uh, you know, managed, the management would have been right from the beginning. Like, you know, uh, management of anemia so that her uh, hemoglobin is well beyond uh, 11 gram per cent. And uh, even during labor, uh, I would have taken care that she didn't land up in ca any case of, you know, prolonged labor or obstructed labor. So care would have been taken uh, in that aspect as well. And also, uh, you know, unnecessary augmentation, fundal pressure, episiotomies, all this, you know, those are, those are all measures, not only in this case, in general, I'm saying, uh, in which, uh, by which we could have, uh, we can prevent, because uh, what I am trying to tell here is prevention is uh, very, very important when we are uh, talking about PPH. Uh, so all the measures necessary would have been taken. Now you're asking me, uh, sorry, am I going, uh, this is uh, about the active management you're asking, madam? Yes, yeah. How, okay. how can you prevent it by uh, implementing active management? Active management. What's the role okay. for we all know that active, active management uh, involves three main steps. Uh, one is uh, in, uh, giving uh, 10 units of syntocinon uh, intramuscularly. The second is delayed con uh, called uh, clamping and cutting, which is uh, over uh, one to three minutes of delivery. And the third is, uh, you know, control cord traction. Fundal massage is no more uh, part of the active management because they say if it is, uh, uterus is already well contracted, there's no point in giving a massage. Of course, it is the first thing that we would do if the lady goes into, you know, atonicity or hypertonia. So these three things are uh, what is uh, very, very important in, uh, yeah, it, go it goes a long way to prevent uh, PPH, madam. Any, yeah. any... <clears throat> so uh, the early to cord clamping really will prevent PPH, but we have to make sure, as you said, that we have to do the delayed cord clamping so that we get the advantages to the baby, all these advantages which are mentioned, which you quite, quite rightly said, one to three minutes has to be established. Control traction, if there are skilled uh, people, yes, control traction should be given. If they're not skilled people and they are in the periphery, perhaps I think we should avoid that. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes, uh, as uh, Sailata correctly said that uh, fundal massage cannot be given. Uh, so what are all the, uh, can you tell me about the uterotonics, which uterotonics you normally practice as in the active stage, Thursday, uh, active uh, management of uh, third stage of labor? Okay. Uh, in active management, is it for me? I can take it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the active management uh, by the guidelines is intosin on 10 units IM or, uh, you know, IV infusion. Uh, but we can also give misoprostol 600 micrograms sublingually. These two are the only drugs which are recommended by the guidelines. Uh, of course, some are trying carbitocin, etc. But uh, I don't have much experience with carbitocin, nor have I read uh, good things about it. So carbitocin, I would choose. I think it is better to uh, you know keep it as a second line. And uh, also, when uh, you don't have syntocinon, where the you know cold chain cannot be maintained, especially in centers like PHCs, I think uh, syntocinon is not easily available there. Then probably carbitocin. Otherwise, I am not uh, fond of carbitocin. So my choice would be always syntocinon. And of course, tranosamic acid is not a part of uh, a, uh, AMCEL. But of course, when I am suspecting, uh, you know, uh, anticipating PPH, I think I would go for uh, one gram of uh, tranosamic acid, whatever could be the cause of uh, PPH. It is going to help in uh, any case, especially when given in time. You know, they say before three hours, if it is given, it's going to go a long way in uh, preventing PPH. And the other important thing is to give it very slowly, right, Sai? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so prostaglandin, yeah, any of the yeah. practitioners uh, practice using prostaglandins, would any of the panelists agree with that as a prophylaxis, as, as a preventive measure? A very high risk case, ma'am. People uh, prostaglandin also because if it's a, in our hospital, we get uh, grand multi still. So in that case, and uh, placenta previa cases or any high risk cases, we give uh, prostaglandin also along with this. Not in all the cases routinely. Okay, so um, to summarize the preventive uh, utrotonics, sintocinone is well-established, anoxemic acid as a treatment rather than prophylaxis. As Ayalatha said, carbitocin can be given when the temperature is not uh, well-maintained, uh, where it is uh, uh, not temperature sensitive. Those uh, areas we can use carbitocin, misoprostol, oral misoprostol is well-established. No prostaglandins, ergometrin with caution, depending upon whether they have blood pressure or any other issues. Which are, which are contraindicated. Yeah. So that uh, the, if she continues uh, bleeding, uh, so what will be the initial steps? Dr. Niti or Dr. Meera can take these questions like uh, if she continues to bleeding uh, despite of that uh, after that, as soon as the delivery. So what will be the initial management steps as well as the medical management you'll start? Yeah, definitely attending to the ABC of the patient. So security airway, make sure breathing is okay, oxygen is supplied. Lower the head end, most of the patients will be upright on the head end, lower the head end. Keep monitoring as well as resuscitation going simultaneously. So volume repletion is the first step to start on a sloid piss and then go on to a colloid. Arrange for bloods. When you ask for bloods, it's very, very important that we ask in a one-to-one -one ratio of if you're suspecting a massive hemorrhage as a four units of the RPC along with four units of FFP and then move on from there. Crucially, we have to maintain the temperature of the patient. So avoid hypothermia so that we don't get into a downward spiral. Start with methargen as well as oxytocin infusion. You can repeat the symptoms non-infusion and oxytocin infusion at around 125 mils an hour when you put in 40 units in 500 ml normal saline. We also can give bisoprostol. I go up to about 1,000 to 1,200 micrograms per rectally. So vaginally, it will come out with the cloth, so therefore per rectally, and also <clears throat> minimizes the side effects. And tranexamic acid, if it's not already given, or if the bleeding continues, we can repeat it also. And uh, with the, the three hours of birth. So uh, methargen is a very good way to tackle the postpartum hemorrhage as management. So if they do not have any cardiac contraindications or hypertensive disease, it's a very useful drug to be kept in the PBH box. Yeah, as you rightly said, we start with the uh, bladder, bladder emptying as well as the bimanual uterine compression side by side. We will be starting all the medical management and you know the safety. It's like, and uh, we know that oxytocin is the first and foremost uh, basic treatment, which reduces 70% uh, of uh, atonic PPH, and it is safety profile has been well established, followed by all the medical management. Next, uh, what will be your... Uh, uh, any of the panelists, do you have any experience on the recombinant factor 7A? Uh, it's called NOVA7, which is there. So uh, enough of you have used this in intractable PPH where I know they before they land up having a DIC. Yes, ma'am. I have used it twice in the UK. Uh, the very important thing is patients should not be hypothermic. Patients should not be acidotic. Patients should not have gone into a DIC. Then only it will work. It's costly. It should be informed early. And uh, you have tried your other methods and there is an impending coagulopathy. You can give it. And platelets should be there. If the platelets are down in the boots, this will not work again. Oh, yeah. And it is very important to establish that fact. So it's an case, I would like to add on something to that. Mm -hmm. So I agree with Dr. Meera, whatever she said so far. So the initial resuscitation, PPH, we start with crystalloids and then we start the massive transmission protocol. So assuming that we are in a center where there is a blood bank, we are ready to give the one is to one is to one ratio. Generally, we'll come back to you later on. We'll start with this. The massive uh, bleeding will come back to you. We have uh, a... regarding factor seven only. I just wanted to comment, ma'am. Yeah, we use the factor seven once we realize that we have given about like the ended up giving. Uh, if there is no, there are few data where they've said that you have ended up giving about 10 units of RBC or something, you can consider using the recombinant factor seven. The only 
only concern is today's date in today's literature also it's written very clearly it's an off label indication even for postpartum hemorrhage we have to tell the family as dr meera said rightly we have to tell the family that it's an off label indication but it can be tried and then established and whatever dr meera has said i agree with that uh, no hypothermia platelets above and uh, achieving your fib uh, fibrinogen level is ideal before giving the factor 7a so it should be used as the last resort after giving a lot of blood uh, you've given resuscitation you think you've done the surgery and still the patient is bleeding only then given as a last resort telling the family it's an off label indication because it has got some hazardous side effect and we did have a patient who did have one of the most most common side effect of this particular drug okay yeah so i had uh, i mean uh, quite a bit of experience with that especially when it started especially if the patients who had liver issues it was very helpful before they really went into uh, a frank uh, dic um, they had uh, pph because of the liver issues so it is useful in certain cases but as you said the uh, thromboembolic event can happen in 2.5% of the cases we should be well aware of um so she continues to bleed so vaginal packing was done and estimated bed loss was almost like 1 liter but conti she continued to bleed how do you do a vaginal packing um, can you please explain dr nidhi sharma or gomati is nidhi in uh... dr nidhi i think she's not there that was gomati okay yeah Uh, in our hospital, after the patient continues to bleed, after we always uh, transfuse the patient the blood, and at the same time we use uh, uterine tamponade with Foley bulb and sometimes condom catheter, and we also use the Panikas cannula, which is very useful. It uh, most of the cases get controlled with Panikas cannula. We are very happy with that actually. And uh, some in placenta previa and other cases we go Foley tamponade with a uh, hundred ml of. Um, thing and bakri balloon iog it is available so that also we use uh, uh, in a case of you uh, train package yeah since she is uh, they are delivering in the, see what uh, the thing is like she is delivering in the peripheral hospitals yes. so yes. before transferring do what are all the methods we will be using that's one is you train packing uh, second is like like uh, someone can highlight me that how the tamponade procedures were uh, what tamponade procedure would will you choose like uh, uh, among this balloon catheters depending upon your institutions uh, uh, dr nidhi is that she can take or dr uh, sai yeah uh okay like uh, you said packing probably she was in a phc so that's why she they opted for uh, packing but otherwise i don't think uh, we recommend that anymore uh, because we have all these uh, balloon tamponades and of course sr cannulas for uh, the you know wonderful control and which are very effective uh bakri balloon uh, uh, yeah it can be uh, inserted you want me to explain how it is going to be inserted or how yeah, yeah. Better. okay so the lady will be in the lithotomy position and uh, with the help of a sponge holder we are going to you know help the uh, help uh, the uh, bakri balloon insertion of the bakri balloon into the intrauterine cavity up to the fundus and then uh, the other end of the the uh, end of the ba bakri balloon is connected to the iv uh, line and then it is kept elevated at uh, you know probably 150 60 cm above the patient so that by gravity also the you know the uh, flow of fluid happens and we can put in as much as 350 to 500 uh, 550 ml of uh, normal saline uh, the best indicator would be the you know the bleeding will stop as you are installing and if it is going to work and if it is working the amount of blood that is coming out through the outlet uh, you know the outlet valve in the bakri balloon will tell how much of uh, blood loss is happening currently as i'm filling up the fluid so if it is well controlled i can stop but sometimes maybe i have to push in uh, 500 ml which is usually sufficient um if uh, yeah if it is not being controlled with 500 ml and i need to push in more so that that is probably give me an, giving me an indication that it is not working and i have to proceed to the next step uh, so that is uh, one thing about bakri balloon but not all places have uh, bakri balloon so there we can use this condom uh, catheter uh where uh, where uh, we uh, you know the condoms we know are not sterile so i would like to just uh, uh, wash it with the uh, povidone iodine first and then uh, you know secure it over a uh, 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 police catheter of size 20 or 22 22 would be better the bigger the better and uh, so i would uh, cover the tip of the police catheter with the uh, uh, condom such that uh, two third of the uh, police catheter is covered 
um, and, uh, and and the tip of uh, the beyond the tip, there is some place for the fluid to collect. And then I secure. I prefer to put two uh, condoms so that it is much more, you know, safer, stronger also. And then I secure the uh, uh, condom over the police catheter with a sterile uh, suture material. And then uh, this again, uh, I can test it before, you know, putting it inside for its uh, leak, whether it is leak proof. And once I've tested, then I would like to again introduce it in the same fashion as the Bakri balloon with the help of a sponge holder. I put it right, uh, guide it up to the uh, uh, fundus. And then again, with the, in the same fashion, like how I did for Bakri balloon, we would like to instill, instill the saline. Again, the same amount, uh, uh, maybe 350 to 500, the 550 ml, I would like to instill. Um, in this, the only thing is, uh, uh, if it is working, I can only see if the bleeding is happening through the cervix because there's no outlet like in Bakri balloon. But still, we can very well appreciate whether it is working or not uh, by the amount of uh, bleeding. If it stops, it's good. And if it is not, that means probably it's not working and I have to move on to the next step. And similarly, the SR cannula works, works wonderfully. Um, so this cannula is uh, available in a couple of sizes. The most commonly used one is a 25 centimeter long uh, cannula, which is 25 millimeters wide as well. So this can be inserted into the uterine cavity and uh, we create vacuum up to 600 to 700 uh, millimeters of mercury slowly. And uh, this, you know, immediately arrest bleeding. And I would like to maintain it for about 10 minutes. And then uh, we need to release it every once in three hours. And uh, we can keep it there for probably, you know, depending upon the requirement. But every three hours, we can uh, create the vacuum for 10 minutes and then release it. We are not supposed to keep it uh, longer than that at uh, one stretch. Um, uh, anything else? Thank you, Sai. Okay, it's wonderful. You just covered all the tamponade. It's like a, it's a tamponade test is one of the tests where we can say that the uterus is very contracting with the compressions. And uh, whenever you do the bakri balloon or condoms, pack the vagina and then fill it so that... Yeah. Uh, oh, that is one other uh, things and then you can keep the uh, uh, balloon minimum of four to six hours or maximum of 24 hours because within four to six hours we'll know that uh, if it is completely the stable then she says she is uh, responding to that if she is not responding if the vitals is not stable then we have to go for the next steps so anyone can highlight this pale, pale is a transvaginal uterine clamps anyone has an experience on it okay uh, so no, Mira, I okay. I haven't so, used this one. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, it's only the paleys. It's for the uh, paley has been used extensively before even starting the uh, uh, medical management. He started. He started using this. This clamp is a long clamp. Uh, uh, this clamp will look like this. Okay, this look, the clamp will be, each clamp will be look like this. There is this, uh, this have two uh, limbs, the hinge uh, have uh, two limbs, which include that uh, uh, cervix, both the lip the cervix. So one for each limb, then this is for the uterine artery. So it, it is actually 12 inch long uh, and one centimeter gap between the two blades. The, the, from the tip to this is six inches long and the bent tin clamp will go into the uh, uh, uterine artery, uterine artery. This is how. So we normally uh, going towards the uterus up to the lateral fornix so that you won't be uh, here hitting on the ureters. So it will arrest the bleeding. By then you can use or you, you uh, do the cepizotomy and then the, if it arrest uh, all the traumatic PPH, we can control it. But atonic, uh, you have to use the side by side other uh, other uh, tamponades methods. Okay. So next is like. Uh, C continues to bleed and we decided to transfer by packing to the higher center. Um, so vanilla, uh, yeah. she is needs to be transferred to the uh, transferred to the main Apollo from our Apollo Women's Hospital. What are the things you would uh, um, do uh, and what are the precautions they should they should do before we transfer her from a primary healthcare center to uh, a main place where the ICU facility is there? Yeah, I think for our uh, uh, primary health center where there is no ALS or uh, ACLS provider, I think the guideline is to uh, get them shifted across the, as soon as possible, ensuring her airway is secure. 
uh she's uh, ma making sure her breathing is okay two adequate uh, lines uh, some sort of a blood available for her so we are actually maintaining circulation uh, if necessary we'll send the sample off uh, with them so we can actually get a sample they for temperature maintenance as well as pressure maintenance they have the pressure garment that can help uh, them actually uh, maintain the venous return uh, so that is supposed to be very useful and all the PHCs uh, are supplied with that in uh, India as well as in the periphery. So uh, this non-pneumatic anti-shock garment is supposed to help uh, them maintain the uh, you know vasopressor action so they can actually go on. Ideally, the anesthetist or the doctor in the PHC should be able to get some uh, fluids into them, blood if available, and some vasopressors if necessary, uh, airway secured, and shift them across in the ambulance, making sure that the receiving place knows the details exactly. So as soon as they receive, they can actually make sure that the resuscitation continues um, uh, with regards to the blood and blood products and surgical management as necessary. Uh, if it is a reasonable nursing home where we have already prepared for them or our sort of center, we would have hopefully managed the patient, got the lines in, secured the airway. Uh, we would have given at least an O negative blood. Uh, the first uh, immediate thing would be for us to have a transfusion is two O negative blood, even if not a group specific blood. So we should have made sure that the circulation is maintained if she's in a circulatory shock. Uh, make sure every breathing circulation is there. Uh, three end organs that we are looking at is that the brain is preserved, the heart is going well with no ST changes, and there is some amount of urine output, a minimum of uh, half to one ml per kilo. So we are looking at something at least like 30, 40 to 50 ml coming out, uh, maintaining a good saturation. Uh, crystalloids are the first choice that we use while, until we get the blood. Colloids are used only if necessary, but if there is no blood available, we can use them, making sure she's vasoconstricted as well. Um, but O negative blood, as I said, should be immediately available for any obstetric unit, uh, definitely in the city. Uh, mm -hmm. Cross specific, group specific should be made available as Dr. Meera and the other doctors mentioned. We should be requesting for a transfusion one is to one is to one, uh, which is the current thought, which is taken from trauma and other major surgeries, but it still applies to anybody who has a major hemorrhage. So, uh, pack cells with the, so looking at somebody who's had a liter or one and a half liters blood loss. Then first we'll thing, come, sorry, sorry, Vinda, we'll come to that yeah. about transmission, massive transmission protocol. Yeah. yeah. So okay. when we are transferring, we have to maintain the MAP about the 65 and the heart rate should be maintained. And as you said, the oxygen saturation and the urine output and CVP to be maintained between uh, millimeters of mercury and as you said uh, the non-pneumatic anti-shock garment every primary health center should have it during the transfer they should be used and uh, how to use it how to remove it uh, you can get the information uh, from the uh, oxy uh, sorry foxy guidelines and also figo guidelines mm -hmm. Um, so in spite of the medical treat treatment, she continues to bleed and Amira and Sai, what are the surgical options you would think of for this patient? She has been transferred uh, to uh, one of the centers, tertiary care centers, and you were called, you were on call and you were called for to see the patient and she had all the medical treatment. She had massive blood transfusion and she, she continues to bleed. Um, yeah. so, what so are the while we are resuscitating... Uh, Sorry, Dr. Sai. Um, yeah, while we are resuscitating, we have to remove the cause for the PPS. For that, we need to know the four Ts, mm -hmm. tone, tissue, um, trauma, and thrombin. So we need to assess having had a four kilo baby, being a multiparis, we need to make sure there's no ruptured uterus or any large vaginal tears. Mm -hmm. Atonicity is a problem. So we need to address that. If he's not had a tamponade, we should be considering to get the uh, tonic contraction of the uterus, which will solve the bleeding and thrombin as well, constantly checking, as well as checking her fibrinogen levels. If we have to come to a stage where we have to remove the uterus for saving the patient's life, that is what we need to look at. Early resorting to hysterectomy, removing the cause for PPH, if it's going to save the mother's life, that has to be done early enough so as to save her. Yeah, so you remove the, I mean, you have uh, made sure that everything... I'm assuming good. all the other things have done. Yes. Otherwise, yes. if if tamponade is working, then we don't need to go to the next step. But if tamponade is not working, no. we should be possibly considering B-Lynch, 
which is the compression sutures. But before proceeding to the bailing, we'll have to make sure an anteroposterior compression is done by the assistant. If that compression is working, B lynch will work. If the compression is not working, then B lynch will not work. Then we can go on to a stepwise devascularization and uh, reduce the bleeding. But I, because I was told master transfusion has already been done and other measures have been carried out, I would resort to it, but maybe that has not solved the problem. So uh, basically the tamponade uh, did not really work for her and she continued to bleed and uterine artery ligation may not be useful in this patient but then again this can be one of the choices which you can use if you face with the atonic PPH during cesarean section and um, uh, B lynch as you said would be the right option and if you compress and it is uh, really not bleeding then yes you can go for B lynch. And what are this Heyman vertical sutures uh, made up? Sailata, have you used those? Um, madam, this I have not used. Belinge, of course. And this, uh, like our particular patient uh, who has delivered now is a vaginal delivery. So mm -hmm. on laparotomy, uh, this would be an option uh, as I cannot do a Belinge here. Like Madam said, I would like to do the compression test. And if it is working, I would go ahead with the uh, Heyman's which is just going through anterior to posterior and just make a sling over the fundus and then tie it up there. Uh, about uh, two uh, such sutures I'll be taking. And then I would like to steady them, uh, you know, at the fundus by just uh, passing a suture uh, through both of them so that it is in place and it doesn't uh, slip. Uh, this personally I have not used, but uh, I'm just aware of it. Yeah, it it really works well, especially when you're it doing cesarean infection, and really, uh, the, sometimes the placenta gets um, placenta is really uh, uh, massive with the twin delivery or whatever you have done, yeah. and there's a, a lot of placenta implantation higher up, and when when they bleed, especially the upper segment, really doesn't contract. So though in those cases, you can just actually have a modified uh, Heyman's where you can just go through and uh, do that vertical suture and that really, not necessarily two, you can do four or five and it really works. Okay. And uh, other uh, sutures which have been described are uh, Pereira transfers and vertical sutures, which are nothing but you know, transfer sutures. I have not tried this. <laughs> I think the panelists have tried the transfer uh, sutures. No, no, no. Okay. No. Yeah. So the, the bottom line is with this lady, don't delay uh, hysterectomy uh, and uh, be decisive when you have to do it. You just dive in and do it. The most of the problems happen and they land up in DIC just because you delay uh, uh, hysterectomy sometimes. So clamp, cut and drop and then you can suture it back. And the square knots, if it especially if it is a posterior placenta previa, yes. and it's bleeding from the lower segment, the square knots really help. Uh, especially this helps, as you said earlier, that if it's a large placental bed or a twin pregnancy where the bed is bleeding, we can't do much about the bed. These right. sutures are for atonicity, but the bed is bleeding. This compression of square knots help really well in multiple places. There are, yeah, there, there's sometimes we face atonicity in only in one area of the uterus. Exactly. Yeah, patchy. We're doing cesarean yeah. section, especially when they had a large placental bed or if they had an adherent placenta in that area, it really helps. This one's in Hamels. Twin okay. pregnancy can be notorious for that. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Vanilla and Meghna, this is for you. Uh, regarding the fluid uh, resuscitation and transfusion, yes, what are the uh, precautions you would take and what complications we can face because of the large volume replacement with the uh, crystalloids or with the colloids? And if you can take one by one. Um, Vanilla, can I ask you about the crystalloids? What damage yes. it can cause and what uh, help it can be? Yeah, so essentially, yes. Uh, so crystalloids basically are just fluid replacement. They are just going to fill in the space, fill the gap, time gap until blood arrives. If we are looking at massive loss, something like 1.5 to 2 liters, where uh, any amount of crystalloid is just going to cause dilution more than one liter. So one to, if you have just given one liter loss and one liter of fluid, it's just going to fill the space. But beyond that, if you have given two pint, three pints and four pints, then at that point, it's just going to be very watery. The oxygen transfer is less, there's dilutional coagulopathy risk. And uh, also the other important thing is temperature of the fluid. 
Um, and the more we give, the patient starts getting the risk of, uh, you know, just fluid in the lungs as well. If they are uh, hypertensive or cardiac, even more risk that they can go into. So warmed crystalloids, uh, one is to one or maximum two is to one was what advised uh, from the anesthetic side. If we are on table, in theater, in labor room, and by then hopefully we can give maximum of one uh, pint of uh, colloids uh, if they're not allergic to any of those stuff and then we can wait hopefully get the two units of O negative blood uh, that is the idea so you want to replace the blood with blood right so how many yes. are, i mean the packed red cells if you how would you estimate uh, uh, the blood loss blood loss and yes. how can you re i mean how much of units you would decide on replacing yeah so um First, we're dependent on the patient. So her clinical condition, baseline anemia, um, her, and then uh, how, what is the cardiac status? How much of blood loss can she actually tolerate? Is it a compensated anemia? Is it quickly decompensating? Depending on the clinical condition, how much of a shock she is in. Amount of blood loss depends. Yes, so a lot of blood loss can go um, unlooked at because it's all under the drapes so if we have measured drapes as in the labor room in theater as well it might be good but the overall uh, approximate judgment would be to have the swap counts and actually have an approximate being machine for us to know the dry weight and the wet weight then we look at the drains and uh, the suction drains we have to subtract the amount of amniotic fluid uh, as well so if we actually have two suction drains once amniotic fluid is gone we should get the blood sucker in so that would give us an idea of the blood loss so normal cesarean sections or normal deliveries if we have anything more than 500 ml i think we should be watching out for anything excess that's happening under the drapes big clot clots a kidney dish amounts for 500 ml of blood clots so that would be a good amount of blood loss for the patient so combining the clinical signs as well as a blood loss once we've had more than a liter and if she is under eight already or we think that she's dropped the hemoglobin by more than two to four then we would start looking at o negative so uh, one bag would raise by one gram that is the theory so uh, that is what we would expect her to have. Mm. And also it's very important to note that the packed red cells, uh, are actually, uh, it gives the volume as well. So sometimes we can yeah. forget about that. So we have to include that volume of what we are giving, yes. um, especially if a preeclamptic has gone into PPH. Yeah. Um, the platelets, one unit will increase by 7,500. And if it is vaginal delivery, if it is less than 20, we need to um, transfuse. Something. If it's a cesarean, we should transfuse if it is less than 50. Okay. So coming to the uh, fresh frozen plasma and cryoprecipitate, when do you use them and uh, uh, with each unit of blood or how, I mean, what is the ratio of uh, FFP, cryo and packed red cells? Yeah. So uh, I think traditionally based from the trauma as well as from the experience, we have been taught to use, uh, if you've given four units of RBC and the loss is either persistent and continuing, then by then we should ask for FFP. The theory is the RBCs are being replaced, but the volume has also lost coagulation factors. So we want to give fresh frozen plasma, which actually has the coagulation factors to actually for the blood uh, components to clot. Otherwise, in pregnancy already, there is a mismatch of a lot of procoagulant and anticoagulant factors. And if we are just going to put in uh, PRBC, it's not going to help for the blood to actually go into its normal coagulation mechanism. So it's important to think about uh, fresh frozen plasma if the bleeding continues and the requirement is beyond four units of uh, fresh uh, RBCs. And uh, at that point, if we've had a massive transfusion, it would be ideal to have our PTAPT INR uh, to actually help us guide because as you rightly mentioned, a lot of our patients have a leaky capillary membranes or at least have the risk of having that. So we only want to give FFP if necessary because not all of them are AAC1, but they will just take in 10 units and 15 units and not go into ARDS. So uh, I would be looking at first sample sent off. So by the time I've given three to four units, I would have got an idea of what her clotting is so we can actually judge for FFP volume. One bag of FFP is supposed to give uh, 100 to 200 milligrams of uh, uh, fibrinogen levels. So this fibrinogen will actually help her to uh, clot. So pregnancy is actually an interesting situation where we have a hyperfibrinogenemia as opposed to a non-pregnant people who actually donate blood. So the normal FFPs that we get don't actually have a lot of fibrinogen in them. So we have to give four to six units of FFP to actually match what she's lost 
for four units. So that is why uh, we asked for cryo, which actually has 250 milligrams of uh, fibrinogen per unit. So that might actually be more helpful. But again, these are all volumes. So we have to be cautious about the volume, not push her into transfusion related uh, acute lung injury or uh, fluid overload. And we have to be cautious on what we are doing. And that's why off late, uh, the anesthesia associations and uh, Royal Colleges have said that after four units, uh, if, if she's still got in clotting abnormality, then we would give FFP and cryo. It might be even just be two FFPs and one cryo depending on the fibrinogen but the interesting part is to use fibrinogen concentrates which are now easily available because especially in the tertiary centers like liver units uh, where one vial actually gives one gram one gram to 1.2 grams of fibrinogen so when it is more uh, useful to use them and uh, we we actually have access to them so the a lot of associations are trying to promote this so we can actually save on blood products and fluid overload uh, platelets, again, it has been suggested that if there is a low platelet, as in less than 70, which is the trigger value, then you would transfuse platelets, not unnecessarily. So if we are looking at the numbers, the first value that we send off within the first half an hour of blood loss should give us an idea which way the person is going so we can repeat the bloods in an hour and then see. But if there is a torrential bleeding and we have no control, then we just ask for 4 is to 4 is to 1 and we just get on with it because there's no time to wait for the blood reports to come. So here what I want to highlight the fact is that FFP has got, I mean, by giving FFP, we can fluid overload as well. So try to add in cryo as well to increase your fibrinogen, especially when the patient is in DIC. Yep. Thank you, Vanilla. Um, Thank you. And then, uh, Meghna, can I ask you, what are the uh, transfusion reactions you face in ICU when you actually, um, we have given a tra massive transfusion? Like, you know, we had patients where you give 40 units and of uh, packed cells and um, lots of FFP and cryo. So what are the uh, transfusion risks and reactions which you can face in uh, CCU and how to combat that? Some of the most common problems, if I were to tell about the transmission, so massive transmission protocol includes trally. Dr. Venela has already mentioned about trally. So trally is like a, uh, it's like an acute lung injury. So it's like an ARDS phenomenon. Immediately, the you can see that the patient becomes hypoxic. The X-ray infiltrates start showing up. The next thing is TACO, transmission associated circulatory overload. It's very difficult most of the times to differentiate between TACO and TRALI because most of, both of them will behave the very similar way. The only difference will be TACO will be associated usually with a higher blood pressure. Whereas a TRALI will be normally, it will be a normal blood pressure. The patient is hypoxic and their lung infiltrates will be there. And as you rightly said, ma'am, FFP is like, we try to avoid FFP as much as possible. So trying to get off the FFP, trying to have... Uh, a concentrated cryo precipitate, or if you have fibrinogen concentrates, it's a preferable uh, product as compared to using larger volumes of FFP or cryo. So these are available now. And if you have centers where PCC is easily available, something worth considering. But even now, it has not been advocated on a high uh, literature level or high evidence level for even in trauma. So most of the obstetric evidence come has been extrapolated from trauma. So right now also PCC has not got a strong evidence, but that is something worth considering. Suppose I have someone with a very severe LV dysfunction, a mother who is going, or most of these patients, they can go for a Takutsubo cardiomyopathy or have a severe LV dysfunction because of the massive loss. So for them also, you can consider using your PCC. The other side effects that we commonly face relate to dyselectatemia. Uh, 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 so they can go for hyperkalemia, they can have hypocalcemia. So as we start doing the massive transmission protocol, most of these patients, it's preferable to send off an arterial blood gas. You can keep an eye on the ionized calcium because you also need calcium because for the clotting factors to work, all your intrinsic and the extrinsic, you also need calcium to be in the, in the system. So you can consider giving supplements of calcium infusions on and off to maintain an ionized calcium of more than 1.2. Third thing, all of you have been mentioning already, hypothermia is the biggest challenge because already the patient has lost a lot of blood, hemorrhage is happening, and you are exposing the patient to large amount of transmission. Hypothermia is a severe concern. And we already discussed in the first few slides for giving uh, factor seven, uh, you need to have a normothermia. So if you want all your blood products to work, you need to be normothermic also. 
So you need to make sure that such a large amount of transmission, either you can use blood warmers, you can run down with all these transmissions with the blood warmers. The other thing is something called as trim. It is not visibly seen. It is very difficult to prove. It is called as transmission-related immunomodulation. Actually, these patients are immunocompromised for a, for you know after such a large amount of transmission. So they are at considerable risk of infection also. The other infection which has been enlightened here is actually the hepatitis B or the other uh, seroconverting diseases. What we have, uh, what we already know about, or it could be a retrostatus hepatitis C. So transfusion, even though we say that we need to, uh, if there is a postpartum hemorrhage patient, we want to start off early as, uh, as early as uh, MTP is going on. We also want your surgical or whatever uh, the uh, the other fixing up. The, pri the primary etiology has to be taken care of. At the back of the mind, whenever we give a lot of transmission, we remember Trali, we remember TACO. We need to remember that most of these patients by now would have been intubated. So considering a lung protective ventilation would have been going on if they become hypoxic. Um, and along with that, you also need to remember that MTP is going on. You need to give even challenges of calcium to maintain the ionized calcium more than uh, more than 1.1. Yeah. The other thing is uh, how to trans how to guide your transmission. So I think the only way or the ideal way to control your transmission by by using the TEG or your Rotem. So that's where we consider using Rotem. So we can do a quick Rotem and see if uh, instead of blindly giving platelets, FFP or PRC, we can have our Rotem there and we can see where is the coagulation, the clotting factor or the clotting chain disturb. If there is a need for FFP or the cryo, just give cryo. Or if there is a platelet abnormality, just consider giving only the platelet transfusion. So that's how I would limit my transfusion practice. Uh, trying to remember, I remember that there are a lot of side effects. So Rotem or TEG is right now ideal. I think Dr. Ramani was also talking about Rotem and TEG in great detail. I agree with her 100%. It has definitely changed the way, the way we have been transfusing in all these years. So Rotem and TEG is a way forward. Uh, well, yes. in implementing, sorry to interrupt, implementing your the uh, Rotam and TEG, do you think uh, that the incidence of uh, TRALI and uh, TACO has come down in the ICU? No, ma'am, it's really difficult to say because even a unit of FFP is enough to cause TRALI. So mm -hmm. it is not that my volume necessarily or it's it's if I reduce my volume, I'll reduce my risk of uh, TRALI. But definitely instead of Subjecting the patient to large amount of transmission, which comes with it a lot of side effects, along with that economically cost reasons, we are a little bit more guided and we are having a little idea, better idea to how to channelize our blood uh, blood resuscitation. Thank you, uh, Meghna. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, this is what has been talked about. Yeah, Meghna, this patient has underwent a surgical hysterectomy and uh, dispensed, set it into the lethal triads, he set into hypothermia coagulopathy. And uh, how you are going to manage them in the ICU? What are the precautions day by day? What are all the things you will uh, uh, get into the patients? And uh, just uh, uh, give it a uh, gym. Assume, uh, yes, mm -hmm. Assuming that I would have done my, uh, the surgery has fixed her bleeding. Uh, probably she's coming off the DIC picture and she's stabilized now. So the next uh, way how to reassess this patient would be obviously something what we do bedside is fast hug bed. So fast is like taking care of this patient's feeding assessment. Uh, should I need to start some enteral feeding? Is she, uh, uh, because we now know that even uh, not giving enough nourishment to your patient in the first 24 hours of admission, critically ill patient has been associated with increased hospitalization and other side effects. Analgesia. So they would have been under the effect of analgesia. Try to reduce the analgesia. Try to reduce the sedation. Try to get them extubated as early as possible. Now, these patients, most of these mothers, uh, even though we say it's hemorrhage, they are at very high risk for a thrombotic tendency. DIC would have set in. DIC is like a condition where you have bleeding as well as thrombosis both going on at the same time. So I, if your surgeon is okay, and actually the guidelines also mention that you can actually start some kind of chemical DVT prophylaxis if your surgeon is comfortable and you're sure that the bleeding has been fixed, maybe after 24 hours. So that is F, A, and S, and T. So feeding, analgesia, sedation, and T is thromboprophylaxis. 
Next is obviously keeping on the head and up pulse, uh, head and up elevation, ulcer prophylaxis. Most of these patients would have been on ventilator and uh, aiming a sugar control between yes. 140 to 180. Try to maintain them a normothermia. Even now, the uh, the blood pressure targets we've been talking all this while in our talk. So uh, I just wanted to bring in front of the other panelists. I'm not sure if the others are going to agree on this, but there is something called now uh, damage control resuscitation. So they are telling that you need to target a lower map. The mean arterial pressure could be as low as 55 to 64, 65. You need not have a higher map for these patients. Because the higher the map, you bleed more. This is in the initial bit of the uh, resuscitation. So try to have a map around 55 to 65. But if you have done your surgery, everything is fixed, no further bleeding, no further DIC, then you come over to the regular uh, map targets, mean arterial pressure target, that is above 65. So that's how the blood pressure targets will be maintained. And obviously, these patients needs, if they are on the ventilator, earliest extubation needs to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Meghna. Dr. Vanilla, can you highlight about the shock index? Um, yes, I think shock index is uh, an interesting uh, number to actually believe. And uh, it's essentially the ratio between the heart rate and the systolic pressure. So the greater it is, the worse the situation is. So the so higher the heart rate and lower the systolic blood pressure is, we are having actually problems. So... Uh, uh, this is usually useful if you're having a peripheral hospital where the only monitor that they have is something that gives them a blood pressure and something that where they can only have a heart rate. So they can immediately know that the index is heading in the wrong way. They can get the patient transferred across. So shock index greater than one is pretty significant and greater than 1.4 is massive shock and the patient might end up having a higher risk of morbidity mortality. Uh, we in fact have these uh, color-coded shock index monitors that are available in the PHC and it was trying in the UK and used in different parts of India. So shock index if uh, greater, we know that we want to get the patient either medically managed immediately or most importantly, as me mentioned by Dr. Meghna, surgically fixed ASAP. Either the skilled person goes to the place where the patient is so that the help arrives early and we prevent transfer or the patient comes to where the skilled person is so the surgically they have treated the uterus uh, before the damage becomes uh, you know systemic and then we are uh, just cat catching on problems. Uh, the last uh, question to uh, Meghna. Um, Meghna, what is the fibrinogen level you want to uh, achieve when actually the patient is in DIC so that they don't, you have done the hysterectomy, still she's uh, trying to bleed and she's having bleeding. And again, no, the you guys call us and say open up again. So what is the ideal uh, fibrinogen level or what are the, uh, what is the situation where the DIC can be corrected well so that you know, she does, she stops bleeding? My ideal target, as you have rightly mentioned, is more than 200 milligram per deciliter. So the serum fibrinogen level already, uh, most of the uh, mothers will be a little hypofibrinogenic. That's why unlike other uh, the other general population where we target 300, for the postpartum hemorrhage patients, we have kept the target of about 200. So if it is less than 200, we can uh, we can we immediately need to consider uh, using cryoprecipitate. I also want to bring your attention to the fact that uh, the fibrinogen level, even though we write it and we send it to the labs, again there is considerable amount of delay. If in fact our rotem or the tech what we have, there is a number in that which called as uh, uh, it's called as 50m. So it can actually pick up. You, you don't have to. It's like an arterial blood gas. You don't have to even wait for your absolute serum fibrinogen level. If the 50m is less than 12, you say that the fibrinogen is less than 200. So when they compared these two levels, more or less they were correlated. So you can use fibrinogen less than 200 cryoprecipitate. Obviously, if the the severe hypofibrinogenemia, you need to start. You anticipate that more and more vol volume is needed. You can consider using cryo. Cryoprecipitate, uh, other than along with uh, all your factor 7, it has also got some other constants like von Willebrand factor and it's also got factor 13 and also uh, by this time you know that the entire clotting cascade has weakened. That's why you're using more and more cryoprecipitate so that the other elements can be replenished. And uh, uh, Vanilla, you mentioned about the fibrinogen concentrates. How much is the cost of it? Uh, one vial is uh, 10,000, ma'am. Okay, all right, yeah. yeah. So now uh, I thank all the panelists for the excellent. Uh, once again, uh, Meera, a gynecologist, uh, this is your patient. So your patient has gone through the massive. Uh... Rishika, Kesha. Hello. 
okay mira okay. Yeah. how will yeah. you all the way you will communicate to the patients uh, what debriefing you will do it's what, how will you deal with your depression <laughs> yeah very important i know it is important i was going to uh, chip in and tell that um first of all the message is we don't have a luxury of one hour like in every other emergency it's not a golden hour unfortunately or fortunately it's only golden 20 minutes we should have made a decision to move into theater by the 20th minute so we have that extra 10 minutes to act upon whatever we're doing so it's race against time number one second it's all about documentation communication communicate what we have documented and document what we have communicated and the same has to be done with the patient patient's relatives as well as our team so that we know exactly what we are doing what could have been improved what could have been learned and so it doesn't repeat again see fortunately or unfortunately all of us are not going to have a massive pph every time but unfortunately all of us can have tonight itself so it's important we go through this like a mock drill every time so we are prepared for it and that is when our mock drills or simulation as a team so it, the management of emergency is not as good as a single person is as good as the team so we need to work in teams and i would communicate with the patients sit her down and say this is what has happened she's had a massive obstetric hemorrhage this was a life saving event nothing but short of a hysterectomy could have saved her life she could face complications she will not be uh, she if she's lucky she will be able to breastfeed she can have lactation failure we also need to look at the kidneys make sure she does not develop any clots make sure she does not develop any sepsis and keep on follow up as well Come and on, most importantly <laughs> yeah and I communicate have, everything the i just have an addition uh, ma'am just a interesting uh, finding we had a lady whom we had like a postpartum hemorrhage and we gave massive transfusion and factor 7 so interestingly this lady when she woke up she had a stroke she woke up with left sided weakness and i still remember that uh, the family was upset so they forgot all the difficult times that they had gone through they picked up only on why she got a stroke so we yes. kept telling them factor 7 was given we have explained that there is a risk of thrombus but they just couldn't let it go so uh, yeah medical, medical legal part also very yes, important and you, you, you asked me as a urogynecologist we can end up injuring the bladder and having a fistula again the patient will pick <laughs> up on that but not the life saving hysterectomy so we need to so consenting as earlier it was mentioned um by um, betsy it's all important about counseling consent but how much ever we do the debriefing also has to be as intense as the consent and counseling and revisiting it and we as a team also need a reflection and debriefing yeah. like it's very exhausting you can have sleepless nights afterwards as well for a week or two so we need to be prepared as a team for that as well two things i want to highlight here for the post graduates and also for the colleagues is don't hesitate to ask for help because you'll be having a tunnel vision with this patient and you'll be exhausted working day and night to get her get her out of the icu or trying to get her to normality ask for help ask your colleagues ask a peer if you ask for colleagues that's number one number two which helped me in my practice is self audit and once you've gone through a problem you you audit yourself and find out what went wrong where how can i correct it next time that will re really improve your management in the next uh, patient or the next emergency you face with and uh, i really thank for the Uh, opportunity given to both of us we really Thank had you. good fun preparing and there is a question on about the pph cannula okay one person has asked what's the role of uh, pph cannula that is the, the panicus cannula panicus cannula but ah. sai said no but she had a lot of experience said, okay okay sai do you have anything to say about the panicus cannula she already told it in brief so she told it okay yeah. ma'am and uh, bg has got a question where is what is the role of recombinant factor 7 yeah, we did discuss this uh, bg yeah. 
So basically, the platelets have to be normal and fibrinogen mm -hmm. has to be more than 50 before we contemplate <laughs> using it. We have used it for patients who had liver issues and had landed up in PPH. It does work um, before we take her up for a laparotomy. After all the medical management, as a last resort, you can give it if they can afford to. And acute uh, kidney injury after yes. controlling moderate PPH with eutotonics and two pints of blood and crystalloids. Well, this has to be done by the uh, renal team. We Sometimes they'll end up having dialysis uh, till, till they get back to normal. They do have acute kidney uh, injury sometimes, especially because of the massive PPH. And also, once they go and have a trolley, they'll end up having sepsis as well. So that gives the acute liver injury, kidney injury. And they do land up having dialysis in a long term and they revert back most of the time. What is the role oh. of PPH cannula? Yeah, all the three questions, yeah. the question mark has been answered. If yes. abruption was the cause and was, uh, you know, having PPH as a consequence, they can end up in cortical necrosis of kidneys and can have lifelong dialysis as well. So this is something we need to understand and important during counseling. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hello. Thank you. We have, we have to stop share. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you, madam. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. I thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to uh, thank you, ma'am. Offer the vote of thanks. At the outset, I would like to thank the Almighty for helping us achieve yet another successful webinar. I thank our president, Dr. Jairani Madam, and our secretary, Dr. Kundavi, for their ever-growing support, if not for their support, ever-growing support. And I extend my gratitude doctor, to Dr. Betsy Thomas. It was a very practical and precise talk and handling PAS. And Dr. Ramani Devi, Madam, who covered a vast topic very comprehensively. Both of them had given a lot of trips which are useful both for the postgraduates as well as the practitioners. Our experts, Dr. Anjalakshi, Madam, and Dr. Prem Lata, Madam, I'll have to thank for adding their valuable, invaluable inputs. And I would like to thank both the moderators, Dr. Sumna, Madam, and Dr. Uh, uh, and Dr. Deepa for uh, taking through this panel very interestingly and covering entire PPH, which is a huge, huge, huge topic. We have covered almost everything. I'll have to thank our panelists, Dr. Gomati, Dr. Meera, Dr. Sailata, and Dr. Nidhi for their enthusiastic participation and interaction. And special thanks to Dr. Meghna and Dr. Venila for enlightening us regarding the management of the patient in CCU, yes. because it's very important for us to know that about massive obstetric hemorrhage and how do we handle them. And I thank Dr. Shravya, our mock for the day, and uh, really fantastic job, Shravya and the shield for the support they have supported us through three all our webinars and finally our delegates for a, without whom we will not be able to carry on with this for their motivation and their participation thank you again once and all thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank thank you 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 Thank I think that was a lovely so webinar much. and lovely panel. My God, excellent! You know, excellent. Yeah. Every I mic would be here. Come on, come on. I mean, you have covered everything. 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 Whatever the practical. Really I think, uh, well Sumana, done. madam, I think you must give this as a topic for our souvenir. Make it as a PDF and give as Deepa. Just give it. Yeah, I will practical. give it. Tell. No, madam. You can just put as a questions because we can add in the souvenir, which yeah. will be very useful. Yeah. So it is really very good covered. collection, very good concise way you have made everything. Very practically everything can be just, you can give it that, you can put even in the ICU everywhere, wherever they come across, labor room, uh -huh. everything. So that it will be very useful. I okay. think uh, you I have think to make it as a PDF. Now and that you have done on PPH1, you have to do on pre-eclampsia and eclampsia. There's always... Um, that is our next yeah. last webinar will be on uh, hypertensive disorders.